Uh, good evening and a warm welcome to uh, this evening's uh, Bournemouth Crisis and Fall Overview and Scrutiny meeting. Um, it's the 2nd of November, 6 p.m. And uh, for those of you that are expecting to see Councillor Philip Broadhead, I'm sorry to disappoint you. He's got an older version this evening. And I'm Councillor Steve Bartlett, and I will be chairing this meeting as the newly elected chair of this board. Um, so, could I just hand over to uh, Claire Johnson from Democratic Services, who will give us a bit of housekeeping information. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Please note that this meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Board is being recorded by the Council for Live Broadcast and will be published on the Council's website for a minimum of six months. In order to ensure the meeting is managed effectively, please could everyone present follow these ground rules for speaking. Only speak when invited to do so by the chairman. Always turn on your video function when invited to speak. Please state your name before you speak. If you have not been introduced by name, some people may need to dial into the meeting and will therefore not have the benefit of visual. Mute your microphone when you are not talking. If you would like to speak on an item, please do so by utilising the raise your hand feature in the bar at the top of the team's window. The messaging bar should not be used unless you are raising the point of order or providing the wording for a motion. Please remember that this panel is visible to all and subject to public information requests. If at any point you would like to speak again, please use the raise your hand feature. If required, the chairman will ask that the Democratic Services Officer uh, will call out each board member's name in turn if a uh, vote is required on any motions. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to a silent setting for the duration of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Claire. Uh, agenda item one, apologies. Are there any apologies for this evening's meeting, please? Um, yes, we've received apologies from um, Councillor David Kelsey and uh, Councillor Beverly Dunlop will be substituting for him for this meeting. Thank you very much. So that covers agenda item two, substitute members. Uh, and welcome, Councillor Dunlop. Uh, agenda item three, declarations of interest. Do any councillors have disclosable pecuniary interests or local interests on any items on the agenda? Okay, nobody is raising their hand, so it looks as if we don't have any declarations. Uh, agenda item four, public issues. Uh, are there any public issues raised, uh, please, Claire? Uh, Chairman, we don't have any public issues for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, agenda item five, scrutiny of home related, um, homes related cabinet reports. Councillor Bartlett, can I yeah. ask a question? Yes, of course. Sorry, may I ask uh, on a point of order, um, yeah. is it appropriate for uh, lead members who are in cabinet plus to substitute on scrutiny? Uh, I don't know. Uh, can I ask uh, democratic services? We have some guidance on that. Chair, sure, I could assist if you'd like me to. Susan speaking. Thank you. So, yes, we have looked into this matter, Chairman, and there's nothing to prevent uh, cabinet assistants, as they're more formally known, to um, sit on scrutiny, provided the portfolios that they hold in their lead member roles do not overlap with the business being discussed in scrutiny at the time. So, Councillor Dunlop would have to consider her a lead member portfolio and whether or not it cuts across or presents a conflict with any one of the items on scrutiny today. But there's no reason for those members not to be on scrutiny. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Ice. Are you content, Councillor Slade? I will be bringing this up at the governance meeting tomorrow night. It's completely mad that somebody who is uh, who has an invitation to cabinet as part of cabinet uh, should also be allowed to scrutinise. It's, uh, I mean, I'm quite shocked to be honest with you, but I'm quite content we can raise it tomorrow at the Governance Board and in the meantime. Thank you, Councillor Slade. Uh, <clears throat> firstly, uh, I, I go, go back to agenda item number five, uh, scrutiny of homes related cabinet reports. Um, this is a very, very comprehensive report and I'd like to thank officers for the work and effort that's gone into it. 
And um, I'd like to ask, call upon uh, the portfolio holder, uh, Councillor Bob Lawton, who is the po portfolio holder for Homes, to, to uh, uh, introduce the paper to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased to pr bring this paper forward. When LGR and BCP was formed, uh, part of the process was that all all uh, policies, especially in housing, but applying to other parts of the council, uh, where you had a policy for Poole, a policy for Bournemouth, and a, a similar policy for Christchurch, that they should all be brought under one simple policy which covers the whole of BCP. This has now been achieved with the allocation policy, and the allocation policy will hopefully be live in early next year, as it says on the on the cabinet paper. Uh, when the BCP was formed, the government gave uh, the council two years to uh, allocate and to bring together the three policies. I'll quickly run through, if I can find my paper, which is here, uh, what uh, what really uh, is, uh, is involved within the papers. Just excuse me for a moment. As I say, there are currently three legacy housing policies being used across the BCP Council, and each one has a slightly different provocation and allocation criteria. These new policies have been developed, which aligns, aligns the legacy policies and takes a greater person-centred approach to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people, residents within the BCP area, whilst ensuring that its valuable housing resources goes to those most in need. The council used to administer the allocation of social housing for its own stock and accommodation. The policy has been developed with specific regard to the contribution of the following priorities. Fulfill lives, brighter futures and connected communities. One of the major things which we were keen on doing, and I pay compliment to the officers and the previous portfolio holder for doing, is that by harmonising the three policies, We've made it person-centred, <clears throat> as I said earlier, a BCP local connection is still in place, but, but needs take priority. Let me just quickly run through. The recognised specific, pri we have a recognised and specific priority for corporate parents, parents roles, care leavers and families at risk, veterans, uh, where we're compliant with the armed forces covenant, homeless households where social housing is the only realistic poss possibility or prospect of uh, uh, obtaining accommodation. Every applicant will receive a tailored housing options advice. And I would like to stress that each case will be judged on its merits based on the criteria. Uh, so I'm quite pleased to present this to the council and hopefully we ac uh, accept it by the, the uh, committee. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lawton. Um, Councillor George Fakwa, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did lower my hand, but uh, I would take this opportunity to record that I also uh, uh, object most strongly to a lead member um, of the executive um, being uh, on this scrutiny. I don't believe that uh, anybody that is actually a part of the executive should be on any scrutiny, scrutiny panel uh, or committee, particularly that one, one which has an overview. Um, it is not, it does not make sense in my mind for the executive to have the ability to scrutinise themselves. So I'd just like that on record, if you please. Thank you, Councillor Farquhar. Uh, but as uh, your group leader uh, or leader of the Alliance, uh, said that there is a governance meeting this tomorrow and this can be raised and discussed at that point. Thank you. Councillor Milio. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I think it's going to be too late tomorrow. You know, we've got an item on this agenda, item six, which is about the regeneration of Lansdowne. And I believe the lead member, Councillor Dunlop, covered in Bournemouth Town Centre. So there is a direct conflict of her, her role on the executive um, as well as um, this scrutiny board. So, you know, at least she needs to excuse herself from that item, if not the whole meeting, because it's wholly inappropriate. It's too late tomorrow to allow to have someone to sit on this committee with those conflicts of interest. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Earl. And I go back to the statement um, made uh, uh, by a monitoring officer uh, and legal advisor, chief legal advisor, uh, Susan Zeiss, who said that it's acceptable. 
um, but it's for the councillors at the end of the day to decide what they can and cannot engage with. Uh, Councillor Rigby. Um, thank you, Chair. I see that um, the Chief Exec and Susan as well have both raised their hands. If that's on that point, if you want to go to them first before I talk about the paper, that'd be great. Uh, I haven't actually seen their hands raised. <laughs> You've got something on your screen that I haven't got on mine. But uh, I, I can't explain why I can't see the Chief Exec's hand, but if you say you can see it, then I'll ask the Chief Exec to speak. Uh, I, can, I can see it now, thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks, Chairman. Sorry, I was actually uh, I was actually just going to suggest I know that Susan uh, has done quite a lot of, of work on this and research on it. I wonder if if we just give her a bit of time to ex explain a little more detail. Uh, I was in the middle of writing an email to, to that effect to, to others, but I think if we could ask Susan to come in and give a bit of explanation about what she's found us, well, that would be really helpful. OK, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ice? Thank you. I think I've mastered this unmuting now. <laughs> OK, so Cabinet assistants, as they're called more formally rather than lead members, that terminology can be a little confusing because a lead member can be equally confused with a member of the executive because they are informally called lead members. So if you refer to those members who are not members of the cabinet but who are invited to assist the cabinet in certain areas, they don't vote, they're not part of the executive, um, they are there to help and advise in certain areas. Um, there is no provision in law for their specific permission, but on the same, um, in the same vein, there's no um, provision in law for them not to sit on scrutiny, whereas cabinet members themselves are specifically excluded from scrutiny. So there being nothing in the specific legislation, we then look to guidance and um, various other documents from government and from um, the Centre for Public Scrutiny, and I've read guidance from both of those uh, organisations and they indicate that cabinet assistants may sit on scrutiny provided the portfolios don't cross over. So um, in fact there's nothing to prevent members from sitting on scrutiny even where their portfolios do cross over but that would not be best practice and it would present a conflict and I agree with the chairman that it's up to each individual councillor to consider their position and declare that interest if they feel they have it. So that's what I would ask councillor Dunlop uh, to do if she thinks that um, her position as portfolio holder under the cabinet assistant um, situation for regeneration crosses over with some of these items on this agenda. But I would also like to remind the committee that if you um, substitute for a meeting, you substitute for the whole of the meeting and not part of it. So any member stepping out now would, would not be able to put a substitute in just for that particular item. I hope that clears that up. I'm happy to answer any questions, Chairman. I don't have any uh, questions. Um, is everybody content with the explanation and rationale there? OK, I'm going to carry on then with uh, our discussion on agenda item five and uh, we go back to the housing issues. So uh, I invite members to to question. Thank you. I see nobody's hand is raised. Uh, my hand is raised, Chairman. Uh, yes, it is now. I can see that, Councillor O'Neill. OK, over to you. Yeah, the hand raising seems to be very slow. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's more a question. I mean, accepting that the merging of any three policies is always going to be a challenge and one attempts to take best practice from each. Um, I do have a concern in one particular area, and that's actually a concern over vague or loose wording um, or language, which is in danger of being open to exploitation either by the applicant or indeed by interpretation uh, unwittingly or otherwise of an officer. Um, and the, the sort of language that concerns me is very early on in the document, it says broadly follow the principles of prioritising households and broadly suggests that there is uh, flexibility or otherwise in those words. It then is, uh, goes on to say later on in the document, 
false information could result in the loss of tenancy. Um, well, false information is fraudulent anyway, and there is a there is actually an appeal process. So I would suggest the language needs to be tightened up, and if that results in an appeal, so be it. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Um, I would say that, you know, when I looked at, in detail at this document and whilst there is an awful lot of procedures and processes for every specific event you can think of, the bottom line is that there you, that you also have to, uh, on occasion, um, work on things that you haven't legislated for. And this document does give officers of the appropriate grade the, the power and authority to deal with those situations as as and when they occur. Um, and and I wondered if that was necessarily a good thing, but you can't legislate for everything. And I think that's probably why you see some of the wording in the document the way that it is, to make sure that it's flexible enough for the uh, officers to be able to implement the policies possibly can with the various scenarios that they're presented with. Um, so um, I think that's probably why, you know, you, why she might suspect that the, the language might be a little bit vague, but that might be deliberately so. But bearing in mind that they're always acting in the best interests of the residents uh, uh, and making sure that the, the, the whole thing is fair and appropriate and, and is, is managed in accordance with those procedures. So I, 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 I understand what you're saying, but I, I'm not overly concerned because I think that just about every situation as far as we can identify is included in this paper. So I think, I think they've done an exceptional job on it, actually. Are you happy with that, uh, Councillor O'Neill? Uh, not entirely, uh, Chairman. I think the re reason is it's not just a document for officers, it's actually a document for the public as well to make a mm. make application. Yeah. Uh, and that requires some interpretation and substance. The clearer the document, the more likely the outcome. And one of the things that does concern me is this document itself could be held to an account by another authority if so desired. And I think the vagueness in some of the sentences uh, doesn't serve a purpose. Um, and if it, if, <laughs> I mean, if it was more precise, perhaps the, you wouldn't need an appeal process in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the, fa the failure in the document's wording is, uh, if corrected, is protected by the appeal process, and that's why it exists. Okay, well, I mean, I'm, I would imagine that you do have some very specific lines within the numbers of pages that we've got, and, and, and it may be a suggestion that you you liaise with the housing team that put this together just to, um, you know, put out your you know, those areas that you're concerned about. Did, how does the rest of the team, uh, the, the, the committee feel about that as a proposal? Can I just, uh, Chairman, can I just um, uh, take up Councillor O'Neill's point? He, he, he raises a good point, mm. but one of, the, uh, one of the things, as I said earlier on, each case is going to be decided on its merits, and we don't want to end up with a situation where the officers are hamstrung and by the rules, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. We have to take each case entirely uh, differently sometimes because there are different circumstances why people are, are applying for to be put on the housing list or are made homeless or uh, such like. Okay. So I want to, I, 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 I'm happy for that little bit of flexibility there, but I do take Councillor O'Neill's point. Okay, thank you for providing that answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I've got, Are you I've, able to see all the hands have been up for a while with points of I, order? I, I've got, a, I've, I've seen a couple of uh, screen messages saying there's a points of order. One is from Mike Cox, the other is from uh, Councillor Farquhar. So there are two, two people there. Um, and I think it's about the fact that, I, that I've, um, answer the question directly without putting it to the appropriate people. Uh, am I correct? That is entirely correct, uh, Mr Chairman. I appreciate you're new at the job, but yeah. uh, I do think you should be the chairman and you shouldn't be answering the questions. OK, th thank you. What it was, I was trying to provide a, 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 an answer, a, a way through it rather than an answer. Uh, but anyway, um, could, I, could I just bring in Councillor Vicky Slade and then I think if 
Lorraine Mealings is available, maybe it may be useful for her to, to make a comment as well, if, if that's acceptable. Councillor Bartlett, I think there were several people ahead of me in the queue. There's quite a few people queued to speak. Ah. So I don't want to, I, I'm quite content to wait. I know Councillor Rigby was certainly before me and Councillor Earl and Councillor uh, Jackie, your war colleague whose name escapes me. <laughs> Edwards. <laughs> okay. so I'll happily wait till they've been. Jackie Edwards, yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm not seeing any of these hands. The only one is I've the vice chair able to assist with with sorting out orders. The only one I can see is yours at the moment. Um, so, OK, who do you think is first? Councillor Rigby. OK, Councillor Rigby. Sorry for that, but uh, I've only got one hand showing and it's Councillor Slade's. But would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, as uh, Councillor Slade said, maybe the vice chair could help you if your system isn't getting it in the right order. Yeah, okay. Um, I've got a few questions on this, actually, if I can take, I don't know whether um, you want me to give them all in one or one by one. I don't know what you'd prefer on um, Councillor Lawson. Uh, well, I think probably uh, if they're fairly succinct, maybe you could list them and uh, and then ask uh, Councillor Lawson to respond to them. It may be that he'll want to bring some of his uh, staff in on it, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for this paper, Councillor Lawton. I'll add my voice to yours as well, thanking the officers and also the previous portfolio holder for um, putting this together. I'll start with the easier bits and pieces, if I will. I'm um, aware that you're new in the job and you know, you're settling back in, so I'll um, start gently, hopefully. The first thing I want to say is I'm really, really pleased to see um, housing first and hospital discharges be put into the emergency band for the housing allocation. I think that's a really, really good move to do that. I'm um, looking forward to seeing that come into place. What I can't find anything in in the paper is about the um, tenancies, lengths and successions. If you could give a little bit of detail into that about the way that the three um, legacy ones have come together and how they'll be going forward on the actual tenancy lengths when people are getting allocations. The second point I'd like to bring up, and I might um, want to bring a recommendation on this one, is actually about the appeals process. As I can see it at the moment on um, the final thing, it looks as though all the review and appeals will be done by a senior officer. I believe that there should be member engagement in that, and that um, that should be looked at as well with members, whether it's ward members or senior members. Um, involved in the appeals process. So if I could just have your thoughts on that as well, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, the Tennessee length, I'll, I'll refer to an officer on that because I'm not, I'm not uh, completely au okay fait with that and I don't want to give you a false answer. On the appeals process, um, I'm not a big fan of, uh, I'll be honest with you, of uh, member in, engagement in that sort of thing because we have to be careful in how we handle it. But certainly I'll give it some thought and I'll discuss it with the officers. Uh, one of the difficulties of, of it is that we, we, we have to be careful how we handle that. Uh, but I, I understand the point you're making. OK, thank you. Like I said, I might want to come back with a recommendation on that, but if I can have a bit of time first and then um, think of some words and then that, Chair. OK. Um, someone said... Councillor Edwards, who's next? Then, yes. Councillor Edwards is next. Councillor sure. Edwards, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm still not seeing his hands. I'm still yeah, only seeing Slade. Councillor Slade. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Okay. I, 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 I've got a couple of requests. That's one for now. And it's referring to the unacceptable behaviour. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more of a robust policy here for certainly with. Uh, eviction of tenants, uh, especially where they've got a crim criminal activity such as drug dealing or other antisocial behaviour where it impacts very strongly on their on the other residents there who live amongst them. That's Lawton. Uh, we have a, there is a strong policy, a strong uh, enforcement on antisocial behaviour uh, of, of all forms, uh, whether it's noise, uh, uh, loud parties, uh, drug use, alcohol use, 
or just general violence. Uh, we have a very strong policy which we enforce and we have carried out a number under the Bournemouth Council. We did carry out evictions for people who carried out that sort of thing. So it is in place and it does. we do carry it out. Thank you. Anything else, Councillor Edwards? Do you want me to ask my other question? Yes. <laughs> It's um, with regard to the council using agencies for social housing. Um, do we know if the tenants have similar levels of support and checks that our council tenants have um, with, with the social housing agencies that we use? Uh, I can't answer that question. If I can ask Mr Tomlin to answer that question, if he's there or Sarah Smith, please. Hello, yes. Um, did you, sorry, Sarah Smith, I should say, clearly I'm not Ben Tomlin. Um, would you like me to respond to Councillor Rigby's questions at the same time? Sorry, just. Uh, yes, please, on the tenancy, yes. Okay. Um, so the, um, the tenancy lengths, I'm assuming that you are referring to when we reassess people, how are we going to deal with the length of time that they've been on the register? Is that, is that correct? in my understanding? Uh, yes, yeah, that would be said, thanks. Um, so we haven't actually um, finished formalising the plan for how we are going to reassess everybody. We are looking, um, there's a project happening at the moment to make sure that whatever way we do it, it is fair and that we're not unduly penalising anybody over lengths on the register. Um, I think there were some concerns initially raised that uh, in Bournemouth residents had been on the register for longer perhaps than in Paul and Christchurch where the registers were reassessed in recent years but actually when I looked at the figures most people across the whole of BCP had applied within the last five years so it it seems, I think, that, that we were concerned that there was more of an issue that there is, but we definitely do want to make sure that we, we apply some weighting so that, that is, there is some fairness there when we reassess. Um, I just wanted to pick up on your question about reviews. So um, reviews, the way that reviews are managed is actually set out in, in the Housing Act. It's set out in law. Um, it's always carried out by a single senior officer who was not involved or had no sort of dealings with the case originally. I haven't seen anywhere in law that, that it is a group of people or that it can have member involvement. The review is to consider whether the decision that was made at the time was in line with the housing allocations policy. Um, and so it's looking at it on a point of law and then to consider whether based on any new information it should be uh, reassessed whether there is something within the policy that then changes that decision so wh whoever was involved would have to have a good legal understanding of housing and the act and the housing allocations policy which is why it's usually set out to be a senior officer um, I, I can check if there is anywhere else where there is member involvement if you would like me to um, and just see if there's any precedent for that. Um, but I just wanted to kind of set out what that was. Um, the question about, um, there was a concern at the beginning raised about um, the whether, where it says may take action with regards to tenancy fraud. The reason it says may is because this policy apply, applies also to social housing landlords who obviously we don't have control over and they may choose not to take somebody to court for housing fraud. Obviously for our own stock we would probably take a harder line but that, that's the reason that that says may because we're not we don't have legal control over what what they do. Um, and I have just forgotten the last point. I'm so sorry. I do apologise. The last point that you wanted me to respond on was ASB. Oh, so um, 
so yes yeah, so unacceptable behavior actually how unacceptable behavior is managed sits completely outside of the outside of the housing allocations policy um, we do have within the policy how we will respond to applicants who have committed antisocial behavior and we also have the ability within the policy to um, sensitively let into an area which has experienced antisocial behaviour in the past and consider more sensitively who we might put into a vacancy and that, that sits within the policy under sensitive lets. Mm. Is there anything okay. else? Whilst you're there, I'd like to ask a question if I may. Mm -hmm. um, is there any appeals process at all that involves councillor uh, members through for example the appeals committee does that any involvement at all there um there there isn't so with with um the right to review um any that so applicants have the right to review any decision that's made within the housing allocations policy it, the, the next step on for that is actually judicial review. So if somebody goes through the reviews process and they and they aren't happy with the decision, their next step literally is to take the council to court on a point of law, which is which is why it's always a, a senior officer who's involved who would understand the the legality of the Housing Act and the policy. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Councillor Slade, your hand is still stuck up and it's still the only one. Uh, well, George is behind me, I think, because I can now see them. And then Jackie's got her hand up again. Um, I didn't know if Jackie wanted to come back on a question, but I've, I've got a number of questions that I'd like to ask the portfolio holder. Um, and uh, and depending upon the response, I may well have um, a couple of um, recommendations for amendments, if that's OK. So just giving you a bit of a heads up. A um, couple of simple ones. First of all, um, there's some information around um, guarantors and my simple question um with people under 18 not being able to form a tenancy can you confirm whether our care leavers would have the bcp council as the guarantor um if if they were actually um going into independent uh, living of some sort that's a simple one um the second question is around there's a lot in there about if you have an emergent if you're emergency banding and you have a direct let and reject it you lose your emergency banding but if you are if you bid for a, um, a property and you then don't go through with it is there any sort of sanction that follows um, with people being downgraded through um, wasting time of officers and whatever when they've actually specifically bid for a property um, and the other quite quick question I have is around why is it that we're talking about moving people, moving victims when they um, uh, are, the vic uh, are subject to antisocial behaviour in social housing? When the victim, there's often multiple victims and there's an awful lot of issues that, that I've had come to me in the last year and a half where um, victims of antisocial behaviour have been very upset because one victim's been moved, another hasn't. Should we not be moving the purpose? the perpetrator out and allowing families to maintain their their connections so they're three sim simple questions um, <laughs> do you want to answer them first yeah, thank you for those Dr. simple Lord. questions Mrs. And uh, I'll give you the ones after. Yeah, yeah. thank you for those simple technical questions and uh, unfortunately i i, I don't I, I don't operate the housing policy on, on a face cold face so i'll refer most of those to sarah smith if she can answer them please Hello, yes. Um, the first thing I wanted to pick up on was the sanctions for the emergencies. What we're actually saying is that if we put somebody into an emergency band and we're offering, offering them a direct let, we will be identifying a property that meets their needs. There should be no reason to turn it down. So um, what we're saying is if somebody does unreasonably turn down a property that we've identified that meets their needs, that we would move them to a band that most reflected their needs next. Now, I can't imagine that that will happen very often because we are talking about very specific properties and very specific housing needs. Um, but that's just in there in case we then um, have somebody who we do all of this work and they continually turn it properties down. We can have that, that opportunity to demote them down to what would be probably the gold band. 
um, with regards to the sanctions for biddings, um, this was in the um, original draft, but we um, was removed following concerns that actually having those restrictions in the policy was putting off some of our older residents from from bidding for fear that if they bid on something they then didn't want, we would remove them from the register. So we did have um, quite strong requests that actually that be removed. Now I operate the, um, I manage the restrictions in Christchurch and what I can tell you is in the, since, since we've had it for the last five years, I have not restricted anybody. So it, 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 you would think that people are bidding um, for properties that they don't want, but actually that doesn't happen. I think in the whole of the five years, I've written three first warning letters um, and we've never got as far as restricting anybody. Um, with regards to moving perpetrators as opposed to victims, there is an element in the policy that allows us to do that if that is um, the most appropriate method of dealing with it, if actually um, the most appropriate method of dealing with it isn't to take action, uh, legal action to recover the tenant. So there is there is an element in the policy that allows for us to do that. Okay, thank you. Can I ask my more political questions, please, Councillor Bartlett? Uh, yes, please go ahead, uh, right. Councillor Slade. Uh, the first one is I have serious concerns about 8.1, um, the decision making um, where a so called minor amendment can be made by the head of housing and the portfolio holder. The word minor, again, it's a, a bit like Councillor O'Neill said earlier about the looseness of the word. Um, it suggests anything that could only affects 5%. Well, I think our housing register is something like 7,000 mm. people. Yes. Yeah. That's 350 people. That's our whole homeless population or our whole care leavers. That's not minor. And I, I worry about um, the looseness of that language, that something that could fundamentally change for 350 people isn't minor. So I, I, I'd like your comments on, on that and whether we might need to tighten that language. The second one is I'm really uncomfortable with item 33. Um, the item 33, which I know had some objections, is around uh, expecting families where um, an adult child turns 18 and we then expect them to downsize. That's just creating a housing problem of young people who won't qualify for housing benefit. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't maintain a family that has adult children. They'll lose their fam their housing benefit if they're entitled to it because they've now got an you know haven't got a child in the home or one less child. But to actually suggest that they need to move, that's barbaric. And I I absolutely would like to see that out. And if I need to put an amendment in to remove it, I'll, I hope I'd get a seconder. And the third one, which I'm really worried about, is there's nothing in the policy, although I know it's done informally, which protects people who temporarily move out of BCP. So classic example, family have lived in BCP for 20 years. They flee domestic violence by moving in with their parents in Ver um, Wimborne or Ferndown or Verwood, somewhere just outside the boundaries. They break their two-year residency. They're then not eligible um, to be able to move back in again. And I'd like to see a six-month window where people are able to, if they've had long-term residency, that they're actually able to maintain their position in the banding. Um, so I'd really like your comments on those three issues and potentially if, if you're, you know, potentially as a look at some wording that can make that a little bit more um, people-friendly. OK, I'll take the, the last one first. Uh, people, yeah, you, you have a point. If somebody's lived here for 20, 25 years and for, depending on the, the rationale of why they've had to leave the area and then wish to come back. Yeah, I certainly will look at that. And I don't I don't have a, an issue with that. I can understand your points there. The second uh, one, the first one about uh, uh, minor, minor, it, it covers a, 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 it does cover a multitude of sins. Uh, but I don't want to be in a position as a portfolio holder of making a decision without consultation with the officers about a, a particular case. That's why, uh, I, as I said in my opening statement, it, the, the, the whole paper 
is predicated on each case will be will be decided on its merits uh, and uh, uh, handled uh, appropriately for that particular circumstance. So I don't have a problem if you want to put a, 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 a an amendment through for that one. I can certainly look at it, but uh, I think minor is is relatively minor. On the regard on benefits, I shall ha I shall have to refer to the officer on that one if you don't mind, because uh, it's more of a technical question than a than a political one. Hello. Um... I think there may be confusion as, as to what um, that part of the, the policy means. We're not expecting anybody to downsize. What we're actually saying is that if you are applying to have adult children, that we we wouldn't necessarily consider that you have a housing bedroom need for that child if we are able to accommodate them elsewhere, which is a roundabout way of saying that we are going to consider every application on its own merit. But we do come across quite often families moving um, who have 19 and 20 year old children into um, accommodation and then the children moving out sort of fairly swiftly afterwards. And actually, we've still got people waiting on the register who've got children under the age of who were not able to move into those um, those properties. So rather than automatically say if you have a, an adult child we'll include them in your household what we're saying instead is that we may there may be a better way to do this that ensures that we are providing family-sized accommodation for parents with children under the age of 16 or for families where children are in full-time education um, they're over the age of 18 in education apprentices they are in the armed forces and living on in barracks. And so technically their home is still their home. Um, and also for children over the age, age of 18, where there are long term caring requirements or that that child is in fact the carer. So what we, what we want to do is assess each one on an individual basis and not automatically say we will include your adult children if the adult children have the means to adequately house themselves. If off the back of that, the family desire, don't actually need to move, then that's a decision that we would we would support them to, to work. But we're not forcing anybody to downsize. Does that answer your question? Are you all right with that, Councillor Sloan? Yeah, I'm, I'm content with that one. I'm still trying to i'm going to come up with some wording on the residency thing about a, a, a gap in um a gap in in time the decision making one i i i think council lawton may have misunderstood what i mean I don't no it's not for the portfolio holder to make minor decisions or major decisions it's that if if there is a decision a policy change in the in the allocations policy um which is minor so you know i don't know we add a line to do with, I don't know, I can't even think of it, but you know, minor, what I would consider, you or I might consider a minor amendment. I think that that, that language is careful. It said it says it's minor or affects 5% of the stock. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the bit that worries me because that's a, I think Councillor Bartlett understands what I'm trying to say. I'm just not doing a very good job of explaining it. I do. And in fact, I, I had actually picked up on that myself when I read the report. Um, because, yeah, if you look across the conurbation, you know, uh, the huge housing stock, 5% of that is, is significant. And um, so I, I, I actually agree with you about that. Um, it, it, you know, even a simple change could affect a huge number of people effectively. So we've got to be a little bit careful in the way that these changes are made. Um, if you want to... Uh, suggest some words for that, uh, Councillor Slade, uh, then maybe we'll put that to the committee in a, in a little while, if that's OK. Uh, could I just move on then to Councillor uh, George Farquhar? I think you're next in the list. I've got no idea because I'm... Oh, I see your hand is up. Yes, good. Saying it, Chair, I, I, to, to, to be fair, I have lowered my hands when other questions have been, been, uh, been answered. Um, so I do apologize if it's if it's made you for a track um my question sort of relates um 
Uh, Councillor Slade um, stole a couple of my questions. Well, I should say she put it far better than I would have. Mm -hmm. um, I've got two questions. The first one is uh, relating to the section 34 or paragraph 34 for homelessness. There's no mention as regards that I can see um, directly as regards a connection because we have to be realistic because COVID-19 has, has, has demonstrated that we cannot house all our homeless and rough sleeping unless there is uh, a massive influx of funding. And then even in that particular case, we housed a lot of them in uh, hotels and, 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 and a variety of accommodation. Is There's no mention as regards a connection to any of the free towns as regards the allocation of housing to those people that are rough sleeping and housing. Uh, rough sleeping or homeless, and I would like the portfolio's uh, opinion on 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 why that is. And that's my first question. Um, my second question is: uh, appeals was mentioned earlier as regards um, the ability for people to appeal the decision. I understand the 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 answer given um, that it goes up to judicial review is the next next natural step once it's gone through um, the senior officers and the policy, um, but sitting on the appeals committee myself, particularly in relation to um, school transport appeals, um, there's a remarkable number of families that are suffering um, for getting school transport when they're moved away from their traditional family groups to take up accommodation on one side of the conurbation or the other. I don't think this was necessarily a problem um, when the free towns we had before, um, because the boundaries of Bournemouth or the boundaries of Christchurch were fairly reasonable to to expect, uh, I don't know, for instance, a, a, a mum in law to come over to, to pick the kids up or to, uh, to, 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 to uh, from school while mum's at work. Um, but when you start talking about the allocation that it could be anywhere in the conurbation, then this is causing a lot of issues. So I'd like the portfolio's opinion on um, the uh, process whereby your local connection, e.g. where your family live, on the allocation of the house that you need, you, that you most need, in relation to the waiting list, and how that will actually works. In other words, should a, should should a single mum in Christchurch be moved away from her extended family, just because the only place which is available in Pool? And I'd just like to understand how th how that actually works. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Connection to BCP for rough sleepers is, is, is paramount. Uh, most of the rough sleepers who are made or who are homeless within the BCP area will have that connection and are quickly picked up by the council services and will therefore uh, be uh, accommodated and go through the, that process. So I, I have no worries there. I understand your concerns. People who don't have a connection or a local connection is slightly different, but they will still be picked up by the local services and uh, uh, and taken care of. As regards to a single mum in Christchurch being having to move to Poole, for example, as I, I keep coming back to my, my initial point, each case will be judged on its merits, and it's highly unlikely that the officers will take would would do that to a single mum. They would take that into account, especially if she's got young children, and and take care of that situation. So I have no worries there, and I understand your concerns, uh, but I think uh, I, I can, we can trust our officers to be humane and look upon each case and judge it on its individual merits. Councillor Farquhar, are you okay with that re reply? Thank you very much, I appreciate the reply. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. I did actually lower my hand. It, um, it, it was to do with, um, I believe that um, in the housing allocation, we do use outside agencies um, with their social housing stock. And I previously asked this about um, whether those tenants get the same level of high support that um, we give to our own council tenants and whether we, we uh, do the, the number of checks that we do on our own tenants as well. Um, that, that when we've used an outside agency to house those people. Well, I'll, I'll ask Sarah to come again on in a minute, but my quick answer to that would be if we're using an outside agency, I would expect them to work to the same standards that we have within the council. 
they cannot have lower standards and have a different standard within the council. So any outside agency would work and would operate to the same standards that we would expect uh, within the BCP council area. The second part to your question, if, if, if I can ask Mr Smith to answer that, please. Yes, of course. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say that uh, housing associations are bound um, by the same laws in ACT as we are for social housing um, and they have a governing body that um, make sure that they are working within their guidelines. A number of the housing associations that we work with do have uh, tenancy support officers and they do ensure that um, their tenants are supported if they have problems with um, you know, obtaining benefits and, and that kind of thing. So they, they work along the same um, levels that, that we do. And as I say, they are, they, there is a governing body that makes sure that they are doing so. Um, and um, I think that was that, wasn't it? Whether they're supported and if they are, they meet the same requirements. Yes. So the answer in short is yes. OK, you're all right with that, Councillor Ed Edwards? Yes, thank you. OK, uh, I think. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, this one, I'd like to go a little bit deeper than what um, Councillor Farquhar was saying earlier about homelessness. Um, I don't know whether the portfolio holder is aware or not, but last week um, there was a statement of change came out to the immigration rules for the UK and within it, what it actually states, and I want to read this to you because it is quite new. It says, um, permission to stay may be refused where the decision maker is satisfied that a person has been rough sleeping in the UK. Where the decision maker is satisfied a person has been rough sleeping in the UK, any permission held by the person may be cancelled. So this is obviously in relation to um, people who aren't British nationals. So my question to you is, with this change in policy coming in and with... Um, the paper in front of us now, what protections can we put in place for people who aren't British citizens who may not want to present themselves as potentially becoming homeless or um, potentially rough sleeping and looking for that kind of support from BCP Council where they may actually be penalised and deported, even if they, with the wordings unusual, they could have children in this family, they could have other connections, but if they're not a British citizen, they could be deported for and presenting themselves as homeless or rough sleeping. I'd just like to hear your opinions on that, please. Mm. Councillor Lawton. Yeah, thanks for that, Councillor Rigby. Yeah. <laughs> Is it going to get any more easy questions? I, I told you it was going to get more difficult. <laughs> A typical Liverpool supporter. Isn't it? Right, um, the, the short answer, I've not seen that particular piece of legislation, so I'd need to study it before I can give you a comp comprehensive answer. So if you don't mind, if, if with the chairman's permission and your permission, I'll come back to you on that if, you, if, if that's OK, because I don't want to give you a flippant answer now without having a study the, the legislation and be just taking some advice. No, that's fine. I, I appreciate I put you on the spot and I'll be very happy to um, forward you the papers over as well and get your thoughts on that. Is, yeah, is, please. Yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Could I just come in with a question on this, too? I mean, is there a distinction between the way uh, a homeless person in, of the type that you've just described, uh, that situation is managed as opposed to its relationship to the housing allocations policy, which is what this is really all about. It, you know, it, it, I don't think we're suggesting, are we, that there will be no help or support offered to individuals in, that, in those circumstances? No, each individual will be, will be uh, judged on their merits. Uh, we do have occasionally, uh, from, from recollection, uh, under the ball when I ran the Bournemouth stuff, that we do have uh, 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 other than British nationals who, who, who uh, are rough sleep in the area, but they're treated the same as everybody else. There's no distinction made as long as they're here legally. We, we're, we're, there's no distinction made. As I say, we do have people uh, rough sleeping from all over the country, and we have in the past. I've come across. Uh, Russians, I've come across uh, uh, Chetlers of Act people mm. uh, who rough sleep here uh, uh, because they want a better life. So each each person is, is treated on their merits. Mm. Councillor Rigby, are you happy to accept a response from uh, Councillor Lawton uh, outside of this meeting? 
Yeah, yeah, very happy. It's just something which um, I think we probably need to look at in general as well, you know, not for now, just um, for the future of the policies and things as well. So really happy to um, look at that and get an answer from Councillor Lawton in good time. So we'll, OK, we'll record an action, uh, Councillor Lawton, uh, in a minute for you to do that, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. That's fine. I mean, sorry, to, but if, if Councillor Rigby sends me this, that stuff, I'll be happy to come back to him. OK. Um, no, I, I, I'm not sure, but I can't see any hands up. Uh, can anybody else see a hand up? But I can see a bit of a message regarding um, an yes, amendment. An amendment, right. which, yes. These, which, these are the yeah. two amendments that I referred to. Shall I read them out for clarity? Yes, because I can't actually even see That's them okay. on the chat chair's chat uh, thing. Yeah. OK, not a problem. Um, the first one relates to this minor amendment. Um, the, the wording I've come up with is uh, we'll be able to approve a minor technical amendments to the allocations policy where a change will negatively impact on any single tenant group or any group covered by the Equalities Act. This should be referred back to Cabinet for approval. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm happy for someone to amend my amendment okay. uh, because I, it, it, it is a difficult one. It's trying to figure how does it yeah it, 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 it's a it's a core of people that it needs to be a problem for and that could easily easily exceed five percent okay should we take this one by itself because the other one I, i'm assuming is it slightly different the other one relates to the residency which um councillor okay. lawton seemed fairly happy with um which was uh, the local connection section 18 you currently live in the bcp council area and have done so for at least two years continuously prior to the application i've then added on where there is a break in occupancy during this time of up to six months due to enforced family move this can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis where the household has been a long-term brackets 10 year plus residence in the bcp council area mm. i think we need to be careful it doesn't get abused but actually i'm sure all of us as as, as members have had some really horrible cases where they've been rejected and they're in a cycle where they they move out and they can't get back in and they're in a catch-22 situation okay so, um, now I, I i'm i'm always very reluctant to actually change uh, or alter you know uh, detailed documents in the way because you never know about the unintended consequences of doing that if it's not been assessed by the by the experts and i'm sure that you what you said is absolutely fine but is is it the right way to put a uh, uh, to put a motion in to make those changes, or would it be preferable to ask for officers uh, to make an assessment of that recommendation to bring back? Well, because yeah. otherwise, you, what we're actually saying is that we, you know we're going to agree to a fairly substantial change in in the way things are done, uh, and then once it's agreed, and then it goes to cabinet. Of course, that that will be it. So. Well, can I clarify how how we handled it before? Is that the OBU and Scrutiny Board would make and would would vote on an amendment, and should that amendment be accepted by the OBU and Scrutiny Board, the process that we operated, um, and I'm I'm absolutely you know it may well have changed, but we used to then consider that with our officers. Our officers would consider whether that was um whether that was going to cause a problem or not. Okay. And if the if the portfolio holder was content, they they may further amend it, but they would then decide whether they they thought that was reasonable. But that that the one of the reasons for creating this nine day gap between ONS and cabinet was to give the space for officers to consider what we thought was a good idea and whether actually it was going to cause a financial problem or a legal problem or whatever. But fundamentally, it's does this group support those changes? And if so, it's the job of the portfolio holder, I would have thought, and the officers to to make sure it's watertight and further amend it if if the principle is accepted. Okay, I think that's a reasonable explanation. Councillor Lawton, have you got any response to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm happy to take the second one that uh, Councillor Slade has talked about in the in the break in in service, if you like, uh, of somebody being moving out of the area for various reasons and then what wishing to come back within six months that's that's, that's a reasonable uh, one on the on the minor one i'm just a little bit unhappy about 
referring it back to cabinet. If we're not careful, everything goes through cabinet and, and uh, uh, the officers and the portfolio holder is not really able to operate. But, but having said that, I'm happy to look at the amendments that Councillor Slade has proposed and uh, refer to officers and therefore take Councillor Slade's uh, uh, issues on board in terms of that we're not ending up uh, uh, either co committing something illegal or, or giving us uh, ending up with financial constraints. So I'm happy to take those amendments. You don't, if you wish to vote on them, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to accept them and work on them and then uh, report back. Okay, um, Thank you. I think uh, given what Councillor Lawton has said, uh, I, I, I'm going to ask is there any dissent from that or do we do actually need to do a formal proposed and seconder on it? But uh, if everybody is content, I think we can just accept that that recommendation is, uh, has been agreed for both of them. If, if, does anybody dissent from that? No, nobody's dissenting. So we will go ahead with those proposed amendments to the document and uh, we'll see what um, Councillor Lawton and his team uh, makes of that. And, uh, and we'll uh, Councillor Bartler, can uh, uh, Councillor Slade provide Ms. either through an email or whatever uh, with that wording so I can take yes. it away and, and discuss it with officers, please. Thank you. OK. Right. Um, Given it a bit of a go, I can't see anybody else's hand up, but then I've not been seeing many hands going up because of my system is not working. It worked perfectly this afternoon. I don't know what the gremlins got into it, but uh, if there's nobody else, then I'll move on to the next um, to the next agenda item. OK, agenda item six, uh, scru scrutiny of uh, cabinet related reports the Lansdowne programme and uh, we have uh, Councillor Philip Broadhead uh, who is a portfolio holder for regeneration economy and strategic planning uh, who's going to introduce the paper to us so Councillor, sorry chairman sorry I have my hand up I yeah. know it's causing a bit of a problem the wavy hands tonight okay, um, yeah. just very sorry very briefly, um, in line with the advice from the monitoring officer, I'd like to uh, excuse myself from the next agenda item, please. Thank you. OK, uh, can I just ask the monitoring officer, does that necessarily mean that Councillor Dunlop would have to abstain from the last um, item as well? Um, no, Chairman, it's just that we can't have a substitute for individual items, but but Councillor Dunlop can remove herself for this particular item and come back. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Councillor Broadhead. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I'll, I'll try and be brief, but um, I think it's important that we, we look at this fully and, and go on a little bit of a journey. Um, this is the end of the uh, of what has been quite a long process with the proposed regeneration of this really important part of the Bournemouth area. And indeed, this started off uh, under the old Bournemouth Council um, a, a number of years ago, where we, we looked at this area and we managed to secure a very large chunk of LEP money uh, to, to look at a really comprehensive uh, regeneration of this area. And Again, this is actually part of um, what we we hoped would be a number of different phases on the area. The very first iteration pre to um, uh, BCP coming into formation was uh, for a whole pedestrianisation of the Lansdowne area uh, and the Holdenhurst Road in particular. The idea being, um, particularly with the the very generous let money that we've got with that, it would give a very transformative approach, particularly to the public uh, realm of Holdenhurst, uh, Holdenhurst Road, uh, and that would enable the businesses to uh, really invest more into that area, to, to bring a real sense of place and identity to the road. And indeed, I know uh, from talking to a number of businesses there that they were quite excited about that and indeed had plans to spread their businesses out into what would have been a completely pedestrianised area. Um, however, the, the last administration uh, changed uh, tax slightly and decided instead to uh, move from a, a full pedestrianisation to allowing uh, buses through instead. Uh, obviously, that fundamentally uh, changed the scheme and that was what the uh, the consultation which was referred to in this paper um, actually looked at in terms of the, um, the consultation document. 
Um, the difficulty, of course, with moving from a, a full pedestrianisation to a part pedestrianisation is that you don't get all of the, the full benefits that you would get from a, uh, a full pedestrianisation. Obviously, the businesses um, uh, can't spread out like they want to. And as soon as you put vehicular traffic in there, obviously, um, it, it does adjust the, the safety element and also that idea of place. Um, there were some uh, reasons that, the, that were given previously, and we did take this to overview and scrutiny a number of times, and I've been very um, firm on my views on this um, uh, and and the, the reasons were that the bus companies did push back I think very very hard against the pedestrianisation uh, scheme which was previously uh, announced under the Bournemouth Borough Council Council days. Of course, they did push back quite hard to us in the Bournemouth Council days as well, and we did push back against them and indeed put forward a number of mitigation measures such as uh, moving bus stations, um, bus hubs, etc, etc. Um, I think one of the really key points as well, uh, that the, uh, the full pedestrianisation plan, uh, was that Corresponding to that and, and hand in hand with that was a recognition that that would have some very uh, severe impacts on congestion if you didn't put any mitigation measures in place. So there were a number of mitigation packages that were looked at as to how to um, stop the knock on effect that stopping vehicular traffic would have had through uh, Holdenhurst Road if you went for the full pedestrianisation. Now, unfortunately, with the previous plan, uh, the park pedestrianisation, none of those uh, traffic mitigation, uh, congestion mitigation measures were put forward. So you ended up in a position where you didn't get the full pedestrianisation, which is probably what businesses want. Um, you also didn't get the traffic and congestion mitigation measures, which um, by the, uh, it's some very um, uh, uh, stark actually, uh, implications that that plan would have had up to seven eight minutes um, added to uh, some journeys during peak time which in an already um, uh, congested what essentially is almost a city centre would have been um, would have been very very difficult um, so you didn't get those mitigation measures as part of that packaging but also and this is what I think particularly crucial uh, the consultation that took place regarding that the the, the good majority of those that uh, responded to the consultation also didn't like that plan they were very worried about the uh, the, the uh, knock-on congestion and the effect that, that would have on businesses in the area, and uh, and brutally they would have preferred the the full pedestrianisation. So we've been in left in a, a quite a difficult position because we've got this let money, which is very generous, although uh, less than it was. We've got to spend it by March. So we, if we want to do something, uh, we've got to make a decision quick quickly. So uh, in line with the consultation responses, uh, which were not. Uh, very keen on a, a part pedestrianisation. Um, what we've decided is to uh, go forward, support those businesses, support that consultation, and and keep all of the benefits as we had of the uh, of the interim measures of having buses through, which uh, enabled um, some uh, really quite uh, interesting schemes to come forward on the public realm. Um, the report goes into it in quite a bit of detail around uh, creating a new fire station square, um, also to push forward with the uh, prioritisation of, of pedestrians and also cycle routes with a segregated two-way cycle route through that area as well uh, but to enable cars through there as well because in the absence of having any mitigation measures for congestion uh, that will um, hopefully uh, resolve that issue slightly. I would caveat chairman that this is it's not where I would have wished um, to end up on this. Obviously, we would have preferred the full pedestrianisation that, that we planned at the beginning. But I do think it's a, a sensible way forward at this time, which enables us to meet that very tight deadline of March to uh, take forward that public round, but not have the knock on effect. However, I do very much envision this as only phase one as well, and it does spell that out in the report. So it does give us some time to uh, maybe try and progress to that, um, uh, that, that goal that we want of a, a proper full transformation of this area. Uh, and hopefully one day, maybe even either a, a full pedestrianisation or perhaps, and what we're discussing at the moment, um, a stepped process whereby only electric vehicles go through after a certain period of time. Um, so the big plan is still there, but we've got a very limited time to make this decision. It's quite clear that um, in the absence of full pedestrianisation, um, the, the, the figures were way too uh, unacceptable with the knock-on effect to car traffic to progress with a bus-only scheme. Uh, however, there is a very clear um, uh, upside both on the public realm, the uh, investment to businesses in the area, and also crucially, the uh, enhanced offering for pedestrians and cycles. So that's a, a brief whistle-stop tour of the journey that we've been on, but um, more than happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Councillor Earl. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Councillor Broadhead. That was an um, uh, interesting introduction. I, I did have a 
Wow, I've actually got four points that I want to raise. The first one is just for clarification because the paper seems to be sort of at odds with the plan. So in the paper it says that um, improvements for Holdenhurst Road with continuing to allow access to all traffic, bikes and buses, but the plan says that the fire station square public realm scheme will only allow buses and general traffic will be prohibited. So is it that cars, you know, general traffic will then have to turn down Cotlands Road? That's just for clarification. Sure. So, so again, we've had to react pretty quick to this in order to um, enable the time to be um, uh, to, to, to progress plans as quickly as possible so that we can spend that money by, money by March. Essentially, the difference between um, what this scheme is and the scheme we inherited is that the public realm and the plans for that will remain exactly the same, except instead of it being um, only buses, uh, cars will continue to be allowed through as well. So there might be some uh, some words that need changing in the plans and and, and officers can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but the, the, the major um, public realm stays the same. It's just that rather than the ongoing knock on effect to congestion in the area, we're trying to mitigate that. I see. Thank you. Um, Chair, is it all right if I carry on a little bit? Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, so my next question really is how confident are you about making that deadline? I mean, it's really tight and of course we just going into lockdown again. Um, I was once the broadhead if you can see it materialising by then, if the spend has to be spent by April. Yes, no, and it's a really good point and it's why we've made this a priority to a try and make the decision as quick as possible because it was already getting a bit tight um, and b not to make any uh, particular changes to the scheme that would further put that at risk. Um, it, it is identified as a risk in there that there is a possibility um, that if the if anything else comes up that there is a risk around that. As we all know, there is always a degree of flexibility with these things. There's always a cut off, but if the worst happens and we ended up in a third wave or something like that, then then one would hope there is a degree of flexibility in there but um, we've uh, officers and the team have been putting a lot of work into this for a lot of a lot of time uh, a lot of preparation has already been done and I feel I do feel actually very confident that within the time frame that we've got it'll be tight um, but as long as we get the pedal to the metal that we can uh, we can see this and you know I think we have to because the only other option is that we give the money back to the LEP uh, we don't do the scheme at all and businesses want and need this in the area and you know I think particularly in this in this time and looking around us uh, businesses do need all the help that we can get creating a new uh, public square around the fire station area will be quite exciting it's going to be audio visual it's going to be interactive um so i think um you know with all of the things at stake and all the positive positive around this frankly we've got to make it happen yeah thank you and i, I think really the key word there is flexibility and what i was thinking is whether there is any scope to get more flexibility on that spend because I can see the logic of allowing the through traffic since buses would be allowed access and the area is in need of regeneration but I'm also concerned that the scheme has lost touch with that original purpose and maybe needs a bit more of an in-depth think and if there is any flexibility in that time then now now we could do it so for example I might go and sit outside with lunch in the sunshine if it's peaceful um, and there's cyclists, maybe the occasional bus. But with through traffic, that would completely diminish from the object of sitting in an area um, and enjoying the outdoors because, you know, you can have fumes and all sorts coming from cars. So one of my questions is, if we agree that the through traffic is necessary, is there any real need to invest in an enjoyable outdoor space and instead invest in something more of benefit to that area? So, you know, because a busy road will detract um, and the aim of building community and creating a really enjoyable space for everyone um, will be so distracted by the noise and the fumes. So I'm thinking, is there an opportunity to rethink the, the scheme's sort of core aims um, and create something more enjoyable for physically walking through or even look at reducing the impact of the road with living wall dividers or maybe something like some sort of dynamic street furniture? I'm just not convinced that it's possible to meet those intended aims and allow the all through traffic um, and also meet the deadline. <laughs> so is the plan to spend the money anyway, even if it might look pretty, but it's not actually used by people. Shall I answer, Chair? Councillor Broadhead, yes. 
Thank you very much. He's got his headmaster mode on now. Um, he's getting into it. Um, uh, Councillor Earl, I, I completely agree. And uh, this is nothing that I um, haven't asked and, and wanted to do, frankly. One of the first things um, I, came, I, I did when I came back into post was said uh, was saying, I, I, is there any flexibility on the time? Is there any way that we could go back to full pedestrian? Is there any way that we could we could do it to make it as, as good as possible within the, the limits of the times that we've got? The answer is, as, as you pointed out in your first question, we're already running out of time and there's already a risk that if we don't get on and spend the money uh, that we lose it entirely. Um, as you may well also know, or anybody that's been involved in these schemes does know, uh, the lead in time for particularly road um, orders and all of those kind of things and, and any changes to road networks or public realm take an awful long time, m more than even I realised when I first got involved in, in local government. Um, so a lot of that prep work has already been done. Um, so, yes, if there was a way that we could do it, it's why I'd, I'd said at the beginning, this isn't my long term aspiration for this area. It is step one, I think, in the process. Having said that, having uh, sat through and talked in real detail to some of the fantastic team that have been putting this together, this is more than um, just putting some nice new pavements in. It is about creating a sense of place. Um, you'll you'll note from the, the small drawings here, but there's uh, much detailed uh, work and mood boards and everything that I, I can share with um, uh, with others if, if they're interested at a later date, um, does show a real sense of ambition for this. And little things like the, the movement of the road uh, from one side to the other to create that space around um, the fire station square in particular. Yes, there will still be traffic going through it. There was going to be traffic going through it by the previous plan with buses anyway. So whether it's a bus or it's a, a few cars, yes, one's potentially better than the other, but then it's a knock-on effect that were more the concern rather than, uh, rather than that particular issue. You. Um, but but equally, it's investment in the area. Um, we can do that sense of place, do it on a step by step basis, and uh, and and really try and support the local businesses in the area. But I, I completely agree. If I had six months more, uh, and we had six months more to spend this money, uh, then I'd frankly go back to square to stage one and step up to the bus companies, find a solution that didn't cause knock on effects that that gridlocked the conurbation and gave the, the full effects. Um, I think we've just got to view this as as phase one of the big. Plan. Thank you. Have you um, chair, well? I've got one more point, but I'm happy to come back to it a bit later if you prefer. Well, no, go on, do it quickly now. Okay. Then. <laughs> so I appreciate that the decluttering um, can really help improve the look and feel, um, and it would brighten up Lansdowne, like with the lovely tiling and a new cycle lane. It will all look great and exciting, I have no doubt. But I'm a little disappointed that the equality implications summary was only two lines um, about continued work with um, DOTS Disability CIC. So recommendation D says that the senior officers in consultation with the portfolio holders will progress and then approve the final design. So I'd very much like assurance of the portfolio holder um, that perhaps with the lead member of equalities that the DOTS or DOTS and other disability groups such as Dorset Blind Association are consulted um, so that it can be truly accessible and used by everyone because community should be inclusive. Um, and slightly related to that, alarm bells always go off for me around shared spaces and undefined boundaries for rights of way. So, for example, informal crossings, flush curbs, um, they all cause confusion and can lead to some really bad accidents, um, particularly when you have cars dominating a space. Um, so with no physical curb between the cycle lane and the pavement, like that worries me. I'm also worried we're compromising on safety, particularly for those who rely on physical markers, such as those who are blind, um, in exchange for the aesthetic value and the desire to spend the money by deadline at all costs. So if I could just have some assurance that that will be considered by the portfolio holder, mm -hmm. um, that would be brilliant. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, completely agree again. I work very closely with the lead member for equalities. That's that's why we've we've promoted that role because we we should be putting this stuff front and, and center. Obviously, there's less of an equality change um, because the 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 actual uh, the traffic situation is not necessarily changing from the status quo. Having said that, I would argue that it's been Im improved because as you as you take it from a big uh, straight road to something that's a bit more curvy and a bit more, um, you know, with other things interacting, naturally, as any um, uh, traffic expert will tell you, that does serve to uh, calm the traffic. You've got a very good point that you've got to uh, do that hand in hand with making sure that it's accessible and safe for pedestrians. I'm sure that'll be part of the process, but I'll certainly take that away to prioritise it. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah okay, Councillor Earl with the response. All done, okay. thank you. Uh, Councillor Howes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to uh, put a bit of background in from my perspective as somebody who was involved uh, in the previous administration on this scheme. I mean, we inherited it in a very poor state, which was undeliverable. Um, and um, that was largely due to, to poor scoping at the start of the project. Um, it turns out during our tenure that uh, the that there was a major issue in terms of uh, an electricity um, box which could not be moved in the major part of the junction. The, there's the underground toilets, which we should have known about. They were our toilets, which were buried in a key part. Uh, all this loaded huge additional cost into the programme, and we were forced to um, uh, reduce the scope of the project, which was very disappointing. But by the time that we had... Um, departed and the new administration arrived, we had a scheme uh, in place which the officers assured us was deliverable uh, and, and that included the, well it's essentially the same scheme as, as comes for us, before us today but uh, with the western end of Holdenhurst uh, Road only open to cyclists, pedestrians and buses. So uh, I, I, my, my first question, and this is really a question to officers perhaps more than Councillor Broadhead is why that option doesn't still appear in the paper. We're presented with two options which is either uh, the administration's uh, obvious chosen option and another option which is like a disaster option. Uh, why has the, the, the option that was uh, the preferred option one month ago not uh, not been included as an option with this paper for members to consider. That, that I, I, I will no doubt come back, but that, I think that's a really key point that deserves an answer now. Councillor Broadhead. Yeah, I, I'll, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the premise. I, I think Councillor Howell is trying to um, say, why, why are we not presenting both our option and uh, this new revised option and the administration's previous option on the table? I mean, if that is what he's suggesting, that's not normally how I would um, foresee cabinet papers coming forward. Um, obviously, you've got to make a decision. Uh, the cabinet paper is the prospective decision. It, it then goes to, to scrutiny. Um, uh, I'll, I'll see officers may wish to come in or offer any clarity from Councillor Howell. However, I would just pick up on his earlier points uh, around the, the scaled back ambition of the, the full scheme and the reasons why. I, I completely agree. It's, it's a shame that we couldn't do the full uh, package, if you like, which also includes a very comprehensive, uh, well, actually doing away completely with Lansdowne roundabout and, and creating a public space there. Um, it, it, it seemed that fairly late on in the game, and I think it was actually in the early days of the BCP uh, administration, that a, 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 a major wire that nobody knew about came out of nowhere which is so I don't hold anybody uh, to blame for that these things uh, do uh, you know pop up every now and again however what's in front of us is the, the decision over what we do with the Holdenhurst Road bit again you know to reiterate a point that I said previously this is phase one. Um, I, I would really love to see some extra money and uh, time and effort going into either side of this road, the south end at Lansdowne, and also uh, a much more comprehensive uh, look at the what we call the Bear Pit Roundabout uh, at the very top end of Holdenhurst Road as well. Councillor Howells, um, can I? Yeah, can yeah, I just? Yeah, point? yeah, you alluded to a third option. Yeah, if you tell uh, us what that option what was that option? Yeah, if, if members were, were to look at the papers at 25, 26, they will, they will see that the, the, the two options are presented. So it's not as if, as, as Councillor Broadhead suggests, there is one option just being presented to Cabinet. Uh, there are two options there. Uh, the second option being to hand the money back to, uh, yeah. back, back, back to the LEP. You know, there is a valid third option. Certainly there was uh, when a month ago, which the officers assured us, which was capable of delivery, and that was uh, the closure of the western end of Holtonhurst Road to um, to basically essentially cars and other kind of commercial traffic that it should be for buses and pedestrians only, and that really would have added to the quality of that space uh, between 
uh, uh, starting from the roundabout at one end and uh, the fire station square at the other. Uh, in my opinion, opening up to all forms of traffic really does uh, greatly reduce the, the the benefit to the public of this this scheme in terms of public realm and make it much harder in the difficult in the future to to deliver um, a, 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 a you know to take take the vehicles out of that area and and it's interesting that this has been labelled as phase one because normally what if if this was phase one one would expect at least some indication of what might be included in future phases but there is nothing no no suggestion of that uh and therefore it feels a bit like this will just get through this and 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 it will achieve a sense of permanence yes yeah, so councillor broadhead thank you Yes, thank you, thank, and thank you, Councillor Howell, for for that clarity, which which was as I originally um, uh, thought. Why, why aren't we putting the uh, previous option in as an option as well? And I'll, I'll be really clear with uh, Councillor Howell. It's a uh, it's a political decision that we've taken. Um, we've looked at it. Uh, First of all, we've deduced that the, and yes, everything's plausible, but what are the consequences? The consequences, uh, are, Chairman, are, are quite stark. Had you proceeded with that proposal by the Council's own uh, analysis uh, through outside bodies, this would have added congestion in our town centre in Bournemouth at peak hours of up to seven minutes. And frankly, I think that's that's unacceptable for us at this stage. Um, uh, you know, uh, that, that could have been a decision that he could have taken. It's not a decision that I would take. Um, the second point that I, I would add, um, which is, um, uh, apologies, my mind has gone blank, um, but um, was around, whoops, apologies, Councillor Howell, your, your second point was, um, Oh, sorry. The oh, second point I was going to make in terms of that decision making process, apologies, um, was around the consultation. And again, um, our, our, you know, we've been very clear. I've been very clear that if you have the results of a consultation uh, that gives you a clear answer, you should take that into consideration. Um, and uh, sorry, apologies. I have a 10 year old interrupting me. Uh, and uh, and the consultation was quite clear that businesses and residents in that area were worried about the knock-on congestion effects of that scheme, which is why we put forward the two options that are in front of us. Thank you. Yeah, okay. thank you. I, I didn't I didn't actually raise consultation, but chair, I would like to just raise a point about process here, which uh, you know is why relevant to wider papers coming forward in the future. I think seems to me that Councillor Broadhead is saying that the paper has been prepared on the basis of the decision of the cabinet. You know the cabinet has not made a decision yet this is this pay purpose of this paper is to provide information for members so that they can make a decision in the future i.e next week or whenever the cabinet meeting is and therefore you know it's appropriate for papers like this to include all relevant options it's not for a political decision to be made in advance of preparation of the paper to, to essentially deprive members of the information that they need to assess other options. Well, uh, Councillor Howells, that may well be a, an issue, but we have to assess what's in front of us, not what might should have been in front of us. Uh, so um, I'm afraid that um, you know that's all we can do but do we, do we i mean I, could we have some 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 advice there from from perhaps the legal officer because it, it does seem to me to be a failure in process you know the 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 the, the portfolio holder clearly said the decision has been made a political decision has been made and that surely under process that decision can't be made and, until uh, the cabinet meeting is held well, we can take advice, but my, my well, I see the uh, Chief Executive, Graham Front. Yes, you'd like to speak? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So I was just trying to get hold of Susan to check that she's on the call, but I see that she is. Uh, my suggestion is that Ovian Scrutiny make comment on the uh, paper they have in front of them. However, we will review the paper over the next day or two. Um, the general understanding is that for councillors' decision making, uh, you would normally present all of the options that were available in order for members to make a reasoned decision based on the officers. That's uh, effectively, as I understand it, I don't know if it's case law, but it's certainly practice since uh, many of you remember the Westminster sale of cemeteries in the mid 1980s, uh, which actually caused uh, a decision making process to be reviewed. So I'm happy that uh, I will talk to Susan and we'll review this paper 
over the next uh, day or two. Um, but I would suggest, given that it's tabled as is, if ONS would like to pass comment on it as it is, then uh, we'll review the paper. I think that's probably the best we can say at this stage. OK, thank you, Chief Executive. All I would say is that, you know, officers have presented this paper and, it, you know, we have to assume that they have considered and, and maybe the option that's been given, uh, the options listed are the only options now, given the constraints of the funding arrangements. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I, I hear... Well, can, I, can I just conclude there, Chair? Because the, the other option, which I suspect is the most, you know, apart if there wasn't a political, if it was more than something just political that, that ruled out the previous option, it's likely to be a timing issue that the, perhaps the administration, the administration sat on it too long to, but I, I doubt it is that because essentially it's the same option as the one uh, as, as, as we produced. But it would be interesting rather to hear from the, the portfolio holder because this is an officer drafted paper. If we could hear from the officers as to why uh, as why that option has not been included. I think that's a reasonable suggestion. If, if the portfolio holder would would like to invite his officers, if he feels that's appropriate. Councillor Broadhead, do you, do you wish to engage with the officer? Uh, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not entirely sure we have the officers on the call with us, uh, Chairman. If if they are... Okay, um, I'm here. I'm ah. with Chris here. I'm here. Thank you very much. I think I, I'm not sure if, if Bill is around, but um, but I'm on, so I'm happy to answer the question. Um, and I, I, I think you know, in short, if if the request is, and as Graham pointed out, that we you know we'll review it and have and have a look at it, we we can add that in if that's what's what's needed. Um, that that additional option. Um, there's, there was no reason for including it or not including it. I think it it may just be it may have been an error on my on my part of drafting the paper, but. Um, I'm happy to review it offline and have a, um, reach an agreement either way. So, um, you know, it's, there's no there's no alternative. There's no reason why that wasn't included. It's just uh, it, I'm happy to happy to review it. Okay, you're happy with Thank that, uh, Councillor Howell? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to um, yes think of some uh, words for uh, uh, an amendment or something that we can put in front of the committee to see if they're happy with that? Um, if you feel it's necessary, unless anybody's dissenting from the from that proposal, if, if well, not, I, then we'll accept it as uh, as an. Action. I think perhaps it doesn't need an amendment because by the time we get to the actual cabinet, the paper hopefully will have been changed. So I'm content to accept uh, the officer's um, statement that it will be reviewed and amended, reviewed and amended appropriately. OK, if the committee is content with that, if there's no dissent, then that's what we'll do. OK. Um, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. I have to say, I, I am certainly happier with the idea of traffic coming down the Holdenhurst Road as it's such a major arterial road in, in the town. I, I think it's possibly even one of the widest roads that we have. So I could never understand why on earth we'd want to close it. But um, I think with, with this, I know you're, you're sort of got a time restraint on it, but I think with um, it should be considered with whatever plans will be coming forward for the Cotlands Road car park, because that sits so closely to that area. So whatever happens on the Holderness Road would have an impact on the Cotton Road's car park plans. Thank you. Councillor Broadhead. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Completely agree with Councillor Edwards. Uh, one of the things that I um, uh, made very sure of when we when we uh, started reviewing this, uh, when we when I took the cabinet position again, was to make sure that we weren't um, uh, too disjoined on this. Obviously, as Councillor Edwards uh, points out, for those that don't know, there is a, a separate but hopefully related um, big piece of work around the Cotlands uh, car park, which is a Bournemouth Development Company scheme uh, to uh, to develop that as well. Uh, obviously, replace the parking at the same time um, but again that will have some uh, really uh, beneficial economic impacts as well as well as providing more um, uh, accommodation in the town centre and uh, accommodating more businesses as well uh, but yes I can assure uh, Councillor Edwards that um, the the scheme will be uh, relating to the Cotland scheme uh, obviously that one's a little bit further behind but I've made very clear to officers that anything that we're doing here 
doesn't negatively impact that scheme and actually where possible um, can enhance it and they, they do join together uh, quite uh, quite appropriately. Um, again, to reiterate my point without sounding like a broken record, I don't think this is the end game and I do sincerely hope that as the Cotland scheme progresses as well, we can start to progress the very real vision for this area in a more holistic manner. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Uh, you content, Councillor Edwards? Yes, thank you. And, and I even remember the toilets that were, were blocked up, so I could have told you about those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Councillor Rigby, please. Sorry, a bit delay there. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to say, um, really, I'm quite disappointed with the way the schemes ended up, to be honest. It's... It seems like a huge missed opportunity, which we could have had going forward for completely changing the way that Bournemouth looks towards the town centre, particularly the Lansdowne end, which is a little bit unloved compared to some other areas in the town, really. Um, I'm sure a portfolio holder, um, you remember Councillor Broadhead when we had um, the Bournemouth Metropole Market on Holdenhurst Road, where we shut down there and I think that's probably the most thriving and busy that I've seen that area of town in a long time. This was back in, I think, 2017, 2018, where we had this and it was up for some national bid awards as well. And it was a really good venture where with that entire road was closed off to traffic. Um, it was an open space and I thought that actually had some real potential. And this is something I really would have loved to have seen this part of town moving towards. And it's an opportunity here where we could have really created that space which is accessible for pedestrians which can make it more thriving where we can get more markets in place let small businesses have their pop-ups and by continuing now to allow traffic to come through it kind of takes that away what i would have liked to have seen as a sort of almost a concession to that would be the ability to do um permanent weekend road closures or something like this with the um raising bollards and changing if not as much the layout, but the functionality at times where residents would use it more for leisure purposes than business purposes. And um, yeah, that's just a comment really, not a question if you want to come back on it at all. Yes, um, thank you. Again, completely agree with everything you've said. Um, if, if only we could turn back time a little bit or add a little bit more time on, I completely agree that the original vision that we had of removing all um, uh, motor traffic from this uh, completely would have created that sense of place that we really wanted. Um, however, because we don't have enough time, uh, we were left with a situation uh, which was a, a bit of a, a bad binary choice, really, except the, the situation where you still have motorised traffic, albeit only buses going through, and have a, a very, very real and palpable knock-on traffic and congestion effect with added pollution effects throughout the rest of the town centre, or to try and at least harness something from it. Um, so I, I do agree. I wish we were still at phase one rather than phase, uh, you know, plan one rather than plan eight or whatever we are at now. Um, but we've got, we're time limited with the money. Um, however, I do still agree. Um, I, I love that Metropole Market. I thought it was a fantastic, it really harnessed the very, uh, very uh, unique uh, flavour that Lansdowne has. A lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life there. And uh, I think we should be doing more of that. And we've made sure that the plans that are coming through in place do facilitate that kind of uh, regular closure if we want to. Now, whether we formalise it in the future and make it so that weekends are permanently closed, perhaps something we could look at. Again, it would take more time, uh, but well up for exploring things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. You content, Councillor Rigby? Yes, thank you, Chair. OK. Uh, Councillor Farquhar, please. Thank you, Chair. I remember just a little over a year ago where all new councillors were taken on a tour of the Lansdowne area and the uh, vision was laid out um, for how it actually transformed the town, um, not only um, for our residents, but in the view of uh, uh, the rest of the country. Um, so it is extremely disappointing for me to see this paper presented before us just now particularly about the shared area and the, and the fact that essentially nothing's changed apart from you know a, a shared area i understand the circumstances etc um to the point of options being removed i would support um councillor howell's um uh, move to have all the options put back in for consideration before um cabinet 
um, particularly because what we're doing here is that, and I'd like to ask Councillor Broadhead this, you know, how he thinks it lands with the public, is that this paper as it exists just now goes before Cabinet and it doesn't have, actually have the money to hand back um, the money to the uh, LEP, um, the Local Enterprise Partnership, on it because of the circumstances which are affecting the whole country and in fact the globe um, because we don't have the uh, gumption to call a time out because the circumstances have overtaken us is it really right to actually take that money and to put something in place which will essentially be town and planning infrastructure for the next 20 years or so on the hoof to spend it by March rather than just saying a timeout, yeah, and it's a case of we'll hand the money back to the LEP, and once the situation in the country squares itself away, we'll have a look again. I'm sure that the uh, local enterprise partnership, um, if they were talked to, would certainly understand that not just BCP, but you know, local authorities up and down the country are facing very similar questions. Um, so my question really is particularly based around the fact that, you know, um, the administration has changed based upon uh, receiving money from government um, rather than doing full consultation with the public. Um, is it a case of grab the money yeah, and spend the money um, without actually consulting with the public mm -hmm. once more as regards what they would actually like and just forcing it on them to say it's a shit shared space, yes, we've doled it up a bit, but yeah, you're still, if, particularly if you're partially sighted, you've got to take your life in your hands if you actually want to use this particular space because it is shared space and cars have got the uh, the through route as opposed to the original plan, which was it was a pedestrianised space um, for, the, for the actual roundabout. And again, how does that land with um, not just giving way to the, to, the, to, to the public transport in the buses, but actually giving way to the fact that congestion which you raise um, is uh, uh, as as being the reason why this um, proposal and the only option there are we must go forward with allowing cars to continue going through. We must take the money from the LEP. So that's my question. My second question is, um, how do you square away the fact that the um, the consultation for the Lansdowne program is? For the traffic regulation orders is still open and it will be open until um so two parts to that question how do you think it's going to land with the public if the mm. bcp council takes this money yeah from the let rather than communicating with them about the difficulties that we actually face and the second part is how do you square away this recommendation mm. go before cabinet for a decision before the consultation is actually closed on november 20th councillor broadhead Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Farquhar, for your question. I, I, I'm sorry that you're not as optimistic uh, about this as, as I am. And um, whilst I appreciate that there is a, there is always a temptation to just uh, abandon the whole thing, um, what we would then be doing is abandoning our businesses and, and abandoning a number of other aspirations that this scheme still does progress. So I think we've got to be really clear about what this is and what this isn't. This isn't just some nice new pavements. This is a, a comprehensive, a multi-million pound investment into the Lansdowne area with new public spaces uh, and in really improved sense of, of, of place and feeling. And, you know, as, as anybody knows that when you do these things, if you walk up and down a road and it feels unloved, doesn't bode well for taking that place to the next step so frankly any money that we can um, uh, uh, put towards what somebody else has described as slightly unloved yes I, I actually will take it but it actually does go deeper than that Councillor Farquhar as it explains in this report um, this is a vast improvement to pedestrianisations in the area improvement to cyclists with segregated cycleways which many of us have been calling for for some time. So it's not just some nice new pavements. And the idea that we should just um, throw money back because it doesn't invest far enough, I think is is probably a little unambitious. As we all know, amazing things always start with small steps. And, you know, as I've reiterated again and again and again, we've got big plans for this area. We've got million pounds in front of us to spend in a short space of time to form a very, very real improvement. And I'm not going to apologise about taking that and championing our area. Thank you, Chair. Councillor yes, Farquhar, if you'd just like to quickly come back if you wish. 
Uh, my second question regarding the traffic regulation order consultation, which is open to the yeah. 20th of November. Yeah. Um, apologies, very technical question. Um, I wonder whether any of the officers can help me on that one. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have Councillor Green here with me today to do the uh, the nerdy bits. So perhaps uh, Mr. Shepherd could help. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Broadhead. Is that okay, Chair? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm fairly sure from from memory, I don't have the paper in front of me right now, um, but I'm fairly sure that it requests the authority to delegate to the portfolio holder and and the um, senior officers. So, I, I think um, the next steps, so subsequent to the TR, TRO um, uh, outcome, so I think that's where uh, the answer would lie, Councillor Farquhar, in that you know a decision is being made in principle, subject to the TRO outcome. Did you catch that? You're looking like you didn't hear me. Yeah, I th I think you I I I understand what you're saying, uh, Mr. Shepherd. That essentially the uh, that most of this work is accommodated through the agreement of the TRO, which legally has to be uh, consulted over a, s a certain period, and and therefore this does give everybody the opportunity to see the TROs and comment on them. Although whether it do looks at it in a holistic way, I don't know. And it, it may well be that it's a bit difficult to unpick to see exactly what's going on. Um, Councillor Farquhar, you're looking a bit uh, mystified there. Sorry, sorry. what does a decision in principle actually mean? I, I, I'm new to this, Councillor, carry on. Um, so, you know, when there's a decision made at Cabinet, what does a decision in principle mean in relation to the TRO, which actually come, concludes mm -hmm. after? Um, help me out and probably help out the... Uh, um, the uh, residents that are watching as well. Um, and <clears throat> I haven't got the wording in front of me, Councillor Farquhar. I can't bring it up at this right at this moment. But I, I believe the intention of the paper was to um, acknowledge and to display all the processes that are in play. So that at the moment there is a consultation live for the TRO, which residents are, and businesses are really welcome to correspond with. And this, there were a number of recommendations in the paper. But to enable the time net on the spend, so there, and therefore to go forward with the programme, as Councillor Broadhead has alluded to, we needed to bring this paper to cabinet sooner rather than later, to and to enable to enable all of that work to continue, subject to a TRO outcome that was in favour of the scheme that's presented. So if if the objections come, if any objections come back to the TRO, then they will be considered by the portfolio holder in line in line with the programme and all the things we've just been talking about, and. Uh, and, and they will need to be considered in the round. But the, the, it's about taking everything into play and thinking about the timings in terms of the programme with the ambition and, and, and um, uh, drive and ex expectation around the timeframes that we've got to manage. So that's what I'm trying to articulate here. Councillor Farquhar, are you content? If you are, I, 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 I am. I'm, I'm not too sure that uh, residents watching would be okay. uh, because um, perhaps the, the the language is a bit too cancelized okay. um, to actually uh, to, to, to translate into something which means something to people. Okay, we've got Councillor Vicky Slade wishing to speak now, but um, I've got a few things that I'm going to throw into the bot later, which hopefully might clarify some of those points. Councillor Slade. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, there's a few things I just wanted to, to get some clarity on, if that's OK, Councillor Broadhead, um, just so I've got my head round it. Um, obviously, it's really disappointing that this has been scaled back. I totally accept the point um, that this cycle lane is really, really welcome and the narrowing of the road for vehicles is welcome. Um, you will know as well as I do how difficult, or I will know as well as you do, let me put it that way around, how difficult this project has been. It was probably the very first meeting I had when I became leader in May last year was to talk about this scheme and it was almost one of the last towards the end. Um, it's been horrible uh, and I think um, it's a bit of a poison chalice whoever touches it I think is the fairest thing to say um but I just want to get a bit of clarity you talked about the bear pit and um, which is uh for, for people who don't know it as the bear pit the station roundabout um 
clarification, please. We did arrange for quite a substantial amount of the neighbourhood SIL money, the community infrastructure levy money. Uh, back in September, we approved quite a lot of money to be pulled from the various ward pots to fund those improvements. The paper talks about improvements to that area being done, but funded elsewhere. Can you clarify that those improvements are still intended to go ahead? Uh, secondly, again, it's a real shame that the map which was provided to us didn't actually bear resemblance to what we're having now, but I'll, I'll forgive that. Um, but what I am confused about is whether or not the proposals around what we were going to do, which is um, something we were calling College Green, uh, outside the college and the roundhouse, uh, whether you are still proposing for, for that to be progressed, potentially as a phase two, um, because I think it is a really exciting way of expanding the area as a um, as a destination. So I'd be interested to know whether it, it's something you are progressing. Um, and thirdly, I'm a bit concerned, actually, about the implications not taking traffic away from Lansdowne Holdenhurst Road is going to have with the hundreds of school children who are now going to be accessing the new Liv Livingston Academy um, when they were previously going to be able to walk along a relatively traffic free road. Um, so you talk about disability inequalities, but there's no reference to issues for other groups that are covered under equalities, uh, particularly children. Um, and just a little suggestion for you, I think it would be great if you could make a commitment uh, in fairness to the point about what does phase two look like? Can we look to close off Holdenhurst, um, which way is Holdenhurst, isn't it? The, from Fire Station Square down to Lansdowne Roundabout in the future. Can you make sure that infrastructure goes in underneath the road, which will allow for barriers uh, to come up at a later date, when we had a zebra crossing put in in Broadstone that we thought might not be good enough, we made sure that the the right stuff was put under the road so it could be upgraded to a, um, a, a touch button crossing if it was needed. It will be good to know that bus gates or gates that could close things off to allow it to be pedestrianised at weekends was put in under the ground because it's far cheaper to do it when you're resurfacing than to have put it in at a later date. So I'd like to, if we can commit to that, which will be relatively inexpensive, it would demonstrate an intent to make it go further later on. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Slade. I'll take your questions in reverse order because it's it's more fun. Um, the the last one first, which is about the the infrastructure, um, it, not not just a, a huge thing that I've advocated in the past, but if Councillor Green was here, who's the kind of roads expert? but it's like one of his, his passions. If you're going to dig up the roads, use that opportunity to, to do other things. And it's not just about um, our own infrastructure, it's about other infrastructure as well. And I know he's been doing, this a slight tangent, but I know he's been doing an awful lot of work to really, really force the... Um, uh, the coordination of different utility uh, suppliers when planned roadworks are coming in. Because, I mean, how many times have all of us had a, an email from a resident complaining that two weeks after their road's been dug up, the gas men are there uh, digging the road up as well? So, yes, that's certainly something that we'll be looking at uh, across the board, actually, as well. But also, as, as Councillor Slade uh, will know, uh, what is already very beneficial in the Lansdowne area is it has our super duper uh, fiber optic cables already in the ground there. And again, it was one of the, uh, again, the things we started uh, many years ago now in a part of our smart cities program um, and it's why we need this investment so so dearly here because we already have um, some amazing fiber optics some uh, work which is progressing uh, with 5g including some uh, very important 5g health monitoring as well um, uh, all, all were already in there. So that is all in the ground. I think will actually help if we progress to further phases to uh, to relatively future proof this area, however it turns out in the end. Uh, the, the, the second point that she made was around uh, around the traffic implications, particularly around the school. Um, and I, again, I'll, I'll make no apologies about the fact that this is not an ideal scenario that we find ourselves in. As I've explained a number of times, um, and as Councillor Earl said at the very beginning of the scrutiny, we're already in danger um, if we don't start getting 
playing spades in the ground tomorrow um, that this uh, scheme could fall foul of not being able to have the money spent in time. Um, so uh, really, we're in quite a stark position where, you know, if we really want this investment in the area, we have to make a decision. Uh, it's not going to be ideal. But I know, um, again, that equalities work, as I committed to earlier, um, will we'll definitely take all of that into consideration. And then the final point, which was kind of related, was about uh, basically what does phase two look like and where are we going to go from here? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spell out my vision here because I don't have a monopoly on all the answers. Uh, I'm very keen to work with members on this, not just ward colleagues, but all members. Uh, and I've already spoken to officers about having some very early workshops around what, what next looks like. Um, as as Councillor Slade has pointed out, uh, on that south side, there's some really... Um, positive options around public realm, uh, public realm that can help to really take the area forward, but also do something which is even perhaps more crucial. In, in Bournemouth, we're in this um, uh, interesting position where the train station is quite far away from a lot of things. Um, so it, it's how do we uh, create that sense of arrival for the train station, draw people down in a safe area, in a, sorry, in a safe way down to other areas such as the beach and the and the high streets, um, and, and also use that opportunity to create different senses of places. Um, all great stuff, all stuff that we need to work on collectively, but all, unfortunately, subject to that, which is always the problem in local government, which is funds. And uh, at the moment, we don't have any money to progress phase two, but I'm very confident if we get some momentum behind this, we deliver on this phase one, we show that we can spend the money, we can spend it well, there's positive outcomes to it. That puts us in a fantastic position to bid for further government funds and deliver what I hope will be the end game vision. Sorry, could you answer the first question, please? Which was around the bear pit. Because that money's already been set aside from money we already have. And, yes. uh, and just, just, just to be slightly uh, cheeky and tongue in cheek, um, we've just released um, a whole lot of money we're no longer going to be spending on transformation. You might want to transfer that or, or get some really good, cheap prudential borrowing. Uh, that was suggested earlier. So always options, yeah. Councillor Broadhead, always options. <laughs> No, the, thank you very much. I have seen some technical drawings about some of the improvements to cycling and pedestrianisation that we're planning around the bear pit. Um, I don't have the detail in front of me. I wonder whether any of the officers can help me out on this. If not, I'm quite happy to come back to you with a more comprehensive answer at a later day. Um, but I know it was certainly part of the thinking um, uh, in that the, the improvement to pedestrianisation and cycling is not just about Holdenhurst Road. I think it does progress up a little bit further as well. Um, but in the absence of a, a more comprehensive answer, um, I'll certainly come back to you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Uh, no one else is indicating at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, if you don't mind, I've got a few issues I'd like to raise, if you don't mind, Councillor Broadhead. Um, firstly, um, what I've heard tonight um, is the uncertainty around this programme. It's been in gestation for a long, long time. Uh, we've spent a lot of money and effort on it. And here we are uh, with a GA drawing, which doesn't even reflect what we're actually going to do. There is no detailed design taking place. Um, we're running out of time and we've got very high risks on the program. Um, and it worries me, to be honest with you, um, that how could we get to this stage when we've got risk management processes in place? And when I read the risk management, it says what the risks are, it doesn't say what the probability is, it doesn't say what the impact is, it shows no risk mitigation either. So, you know, what's what's been going on with the programme management here? Because we're now up against the rock and a hard place. Two great options, one to do as we say, and the other is if we don't do it, lose all the money, we'll pay it back. Um, I really question whether without a detailed design, without any procurement put in place, um, without a spade having been stuck in the ground, whether you can actually achieve this or not. And I, and I sense from, from officers and the things that you've said, although you say you're confident, I think there's a real nervousness about this project. The other thing that I'm concerned about is the public's perception on this program, because I wonder if they really know what is gonna be proposed. It was only this afternoon when I actually got a clear picture of the GA that I noticed that um, Merrick Road is still going to be closed off. It's still going to be, nobody, nobody's mentioned it, it's on the plan, it says it's going to be Merrick Road closed to create pedestrian realm. 
also it says on the plan that uh, it says access for buses only this is Holdenhurst Road for the general traffic prohibited access for loading permitted blah 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 so you know it you know here we are without a GA that even tells us what we're doing and we as a, a, a committee that's supposed to be reviewing this paper it's just not on frankly um, so I'm sorry, but I have real nervousness about it, and I'm just wondering if it is actually time to call a halt, and let's make sure we've all got our, uh, our minds made up on this, and we do actually do what the residents, and it's not just, it's not just the businesses, it's the residents for the whole town. And I can tell you that most people in this town think that the Lansdowne is one of the only bits of the road network that's worked efficiently over the last 50 or 60 years. And there are a lot of very doubting Thomases that think this is actually going to help. So I, I'm, I'm raising a lot of things there, uh, Councillor Broadhead, but I just want to reflect the amount of nervousness that I have and what I'm hearing, especially from Councillor um, Earl, uh, you know, is it really what we want or are, you, are we being pushed into this just because we've run out of time and we've really got no other choice, otherwise we've got to hand the money back. Um, thank you very much, um, Councillor Bard. I'll try and deal with a number of the points there. Um, um, you are you are right. Nothing is without risk. Um, I, I wouldn't be um, entering into this as the portfolio holder if I thought that this was a pipe dream. And um, a, a, as you will well know, there is a difference between the Cabinet report and a lot of the work that goes uh, behind the scenes. So there is a full uh, risk log for the programme. Uh, we've got a proper programme governance as well that has been ongoing throughout the, um, throughout the process. And then, of course, you've got the preliminary design and then you move on to the detailed design. Now, the detailed design is ongoing as we speak. Uh, there is a, a high level of confidence that this is um, possible, not not possible, but but um, we are going to do this within the time frame. You also need to do that t TRO between the preliminary um, and the and the detailed design. Um, but as, as Councillor Howell will know, who's been working on this for, for many times, um, had we not been here making a minor change to whether cars go through or not, uh, we'd be in exactly the same position probably at this cabinet meeting um, with essentially what is the same actual physical design. Um, so uh, that's why we, we've tried to mitigate any further risks by not changing the design um, hardly at all um, from what was already previously proposed. The only difference is, is, is whether we have that knock-on effect to congestion or not. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point that's well made. Um, there is, a, a, like I say, a risk log for the programme. The programme is properly managed and has been managed for some time. And we are now at the, the final stage where if the decision goes forward positively uh, and on cabinet next week, um, then obviously it will be a uh, full pedal to the metal and the programme will, will, will move but, uh, forward immediately. But just to reassure you that obviously you've got a preliminary design here. The detailed design is ongoing. A lot of work has been done and I've had the confidence uh, that this programme can be delivered on time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Could you just clarify the issue that I raised regarding Merrick Road? Is that going to be pedestrianised and blocked off, which is what it says on the plan. Um, I'll pass over to Chris Shepherd, who may be able to give you the final answer on that. Chris? Yeah, um, I believe so, I believe so, although Vicky's got a head in her hands. Um, I, 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 that, that, is correct, that is correct in, in my understanding of it. But again, we're, we're putting this out to TRO for consultation at the moment, and it's in the, t it's in the TRO consultation right now. So we will take, as I said earlier, we'll take feedback from the public on that. Can I just come I, back to charity? Yeah, yeah, just just a moment, Councillor Say. Let me just carry up on that. I, you, you've mentioned the, the consultation. There's nothing in the report about the outcomes of the public consultations uh, that I can see. You know, what have people been saying yeah. about about this? Councillor Barlow, this, this is about the traffic regulation order consultation. Yes, I not understand. About the, not about the previous consultations which Councillor Board had referred to earlier in his, in his pitch. OK, well, I, I understand the TRO consultation process, which is only just started. Uh, the consultation for the overall scheme was conducted for four weeks in November last year. So have there been any other consultations on it? And where are the results of the consultation? Where is the consultation report and how is that reflected in this paper? We have the consultation report. There was a, there, there are some lines in the paper that refer to that to that consultation, I believe, but I'll I'll double check it um, in a minute. Um, we can share that report with the with the paper if members would prefer it. But you know it's it it's been this program has been running as Councillor Board had said for 
actually almost as long as I've been working for this for this and the preceding council. Um, it has been consulted on a number of times with the public, and the report does quite clearly state that there is that whilst people are clear and interested and excited about a scheme to improve the Lansdowne public realm, they are also not happy about, and more more than a hundred of them are not happy about the congestion implications of those changes. So are you comfortable that the people that involved themselves in that consultation know what it is that is now prepared? Because it seems to me that neither Councillor Broadhead or yourself know whether Merritt Road is going to be blocked off or not. I did, didn't I just say that it was part of the TRO consultation that you, we're asking? You, you did, but I'm I, the intent. Is it the intent as part of the scheme to block it off? Well, it's in the GA, isn't it, at the moment, in the preliminary design, which, as we've just said, then has to be consulted on through the TRO to then work uh, up as a, t a final detailed design. Oh, so the final detailed which is what design, Board just said. <laughs> the final detailed design will will decide whether actually a major road in the town is going to be blocked off or not. Subject I mean, to the statutory traffic regulation order consultation, yes. OK, so the intent is which, to block off Merritt Road. We got there in the end then. Um, OK, well... You know, if, if I was confused at this point earlier on, I mean, Councillor Slade is not is shaking her head violently there. Could uh, could I bring him in, please? Yes, please, because this is where I'm really confused, because the map which we were sent, which shows Fire Station Square being pedestrianised, the end of Merrick Road, what we used, we were calling in our in our piece of work, College Green, being pedestrianised, and the lower end of Holdenhurst Road being available only to buses and bikes. My understanding is we were told at the beginning of this meeting that that map was actually not relevant. We were being given an old map yeah. and that that was what we were no longer doing because yeah. we've all been asked to look at that map and there's no reference to the creation of a pedestrian square at Merrick Road in the report. There is talk about creating a pedestrian friendly fire station square, but it won't be pedestrian because cars will go through it square at fire station square. So and if I'm looking correctly at the TRO Lansdowne document, there's no reference to any roads being closed, uh, only reference. And, and I can't see any road closures in the TRO. The TROs all seem to be about adding, removing or changing uh, parking uh, and moving parking bays, bus bays and raised platforms. I can't see any road closures in that TRO. So I'm not clear. And I think if we've got ONS confused, the public are going to be very confused because I thought we'd abandoned all that. That's that's yeah. where I thought we were yeah. an hour ago. Councillor Barlett, may I, may I respond? Yes, of course. I, I put my hands up and make and make and I'll double check what I've sent versus what you know what we've got because um it, it may it may be that i sent an older version of the of the map that of the ga that may have confused everybody so if that's the case i apologize um yes, but i will make sure that the the, the right yeah. version is is in the uh, is in the um is in the in the report for for scrutiny but again like like graham said earlier we will review it uh, fully in the next couple of days okay the uh, uh, just just to clarify the, on the ga that you sent us it does actually say Merrick Road closed to create a pedestrian realm. It does actually say that in there. Um, well, uh, where do we go from here? Uh, we have agreed, I, I, have we not, that officers will look at the options as requested by uh, Councillor Howell, and you have agreed to do that. Uh, I really think that we do need to um, ensure that we've got the right GA, but... Um, you know, I, I can only say that uh, we are between a rock and a hard place. I wouldn't want to see us lose this money, but equally, I wouldn't want to see us spending money on a, on a scheme that just isn't going to work. And more importantly, is not what the residents of the town want. And I'm not convinced that, that we're there yet. Um, Councillor Broadhead. Yeah, if I, if I may just respond to that last point. Um, obviously, we've got some...
some um, uh, some clarity about some aspects of the report to come back with, um, and, and that's fine, and we'll do that uh, as soon as possible. Um, but your last point about not what the residents want, um, the last consultation that happened with the residents was for essentially this scheme, um, but with only buses going through. Um, what we've done is looked at the outcome of that consultation, and the clear steer of the outcome of that consultation was we like the scheme, we like the investment in the area, we like the impact it will have on businesses, but we're very, very concerned about the fact that removing cars will cause ongoing congestion to the area. So we've responded to that, that, that the outcome of that consultation. So the point about not what the residents want, I, I'd say it's likely the opposite. OK, it's not what I would have wanted at the very beginning of the process, um, but given a consultation that was done on a version of this scheme, um, we've listened to the outcome of that consultation, we've amended the scheme accordingly, to improve it as far as we can within the limitations that we've got. Um, and then, as I've committed to, we'll, we'll work further about um, uh, improving and building on this scheme in the future. So I, I see what you're saying. Uh, there's been so many iterations of this scheme that it is uh, it is easy to be uh, confused. But the last consultation that took play, place gave us a very steer, and we're following that consultation's um, respondents. Thank you. OK, okay. I, I think it would have been uh, reasonable to have included some greater detail about the views of the, that came out of the consultation that would have helped us to inform inform this meeting. Uh, right, uh, we've got, um, Councillor Howell, have you got your hand up? Uh, yes, I have, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, ahead. just quick, two quick points. Um, firstly, with regards to the consultation, it would be interesting to hear what the thoughts of the businesses that are actually located in the area that was going to be pedestrianised, what, what the balance of their views was, because, you know, it's one thing talking about people that are, uh, are moving through the area in cars who really are adding nothing to the vitality of the area. Uh, you know, they're just worried about a couple of minutes extra on their journey. And the people who uh, were really going to benefit from this scheme potentially, uh, which are really people who walk around the area, people who work in the area, people who have businesses in the area. So I agree with you, Chair, that it would have been really useful to have a proper breakdown uh, of, uh, uh, of the consultation. The second point is that uh, largely as a result of your prompting, actually, continual prompting in, in meetings, uh, we adopted a process of uh, 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 basically attaching the risk register to um, to a paper to mm. inform members. Uh, mm. I mean, we did that several times for for a council, and I would like to think that that that's established as a process now. But there's no reason and to, why that shouldn't be happening for cabinet decisions and well as well. It may have to be taken in private session sometimes. But, but I think we should be seeing the risk registers. It's been referred to as existing by, um, I, I forget whether it's Councillor Broadheads or, or, or Chris, but, but you know, why shouldn't we be seeing that risk register uh, ourselves? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Councillor Howell. Yeah, I agree on the risk issue because at the moment there's three risks issued and the, the, the presumption is that they're, they're horrible and all the rest of it, but actually, you know, a risk is, is the product of, uh, you know, the probability and the impact that it has. And we don't see any of that, it's just listed as a as a risk. Uh, even if it was an ex extract from a detailed report, looking at just the red areas and looking at the potential impact uh, uh, of that risk materialising, then that, that's probably worthwhile. I mean, because I, I have to say, you know, there's clearly the risk here that we're not going to make the timescales. You know, what is the probability of that? Uh, Councillor Broadhead says he's very confident. Um, well, he, he would have to be. You've got to be optimistic. Uh, but uh, you know, given the the, the timescale we've been going on and where we are, and and the, it's implicit in the report of just how critical this is. And I think, as Councillor Broadhead said, you know, we've got to start putting the shovels in the ground tomorrow if we're going to make this. You know, so it is it is really critical. And I don't and I and I do see that. Um, Councillor, um, I know Councillor Broadhead, you've just put your hand up, but Councillor Farquhar is also on the list. If, if I could just bring him in and then if you perhaps summarise uh, on the paper and, and then th I think we'll move on then. Thank you. Thank you, uh, yeah. thank, thank you Chair, I really appreciate it. 
Um, yes, no, I'd just like to reiterate um, um, what Councillor Howell said regarding um, those which would actually um, uh, benefit um, from the result of the consultation. Um, Councillor Broadhead referred to it, to your point, Chair, um, whereby um, it's not what the residents want to say that, well, we've got a hundred or so replies to say that the additional congestion of seven minutes at peak time is unacceptable, so therefore we'll go down this route um, of changing a scheme which um, Councillor Broadhead said before is the same scheme as was before, but instead of but only buses, is that the uh, the traffic um, normal motor vehicles can continue to prog progress down there? Yeah. I'd just like to to reflect on the fact that um, Councillor Edwards raised the point as regards Coatlands. Yeah, the the big part of this is that this is going to become a residential area, um, and I don't think that the waiting on the consultation um, is necessarily correct unless that is part of the uh, part of the vision for. A pedestrianised area um, for people, as 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 was talked about, a gateway um, at the at the at the at the train station, to make it a nice um, and safe, um, but that was retracted um, way to get down to the town centre, to the beach, and so on and so forth. So the vision of what should have been the Lansdowne roundabout, and was consulted on. Um, seems to be overrided altogether by this congestion of seven minutes being added on and there's been no consideration to the residents to the individuals that want to use the shared pedestrian space or what was going to be a pedestrian only space to the business that are going to be there the people that are going to live there and the actual vision was instead of making it a ghetto um so that is dead at the dead dead, dead at night time actually make it a living and breathing mm -hmm. space that is actually a sense of place um, and I feel the recommendation coming on, but I'm not the one to do it yeah. to say that this administration needs to seriously good, take this paper back and present it again, because I, 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 I'm honestly at a loss. And to, to your point, Chair, I think the risk here is, is, is far too great um, um, in, the, in the public perspective um, for what, what is trying to be achieved, to my mind, on the hoof now against the clock. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the the, the comments that have come before me. Um, I'll, I'll try and do a little bit of summing up, if if I may, because this has gone on um, for for an hour and fifteen minutes now, but. That's what good scrutiny is all about, and I'm, I'm never scared of that, that's for sure. Um, I, I think there is collective agreement on one thing, which is that our plan A was the right one, and it's a shame that we're not at the original plan A. That is not my fault. That is the um, the previous administration took the decision to to scale back um, to the, the halfway position that we inherited. Um, we, we've had to um, look at that in the space of time as we've explored and 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 make a, make a decision that, yes, I'm not going to lie, this is not the panacea. Year. This is not the full end game that we want for this area, but there are some substantial improvements that happen to this, to businesses, to pedestrians, to cyclists. And as I've said before, it is a very good stepping stone um, to what I hope will be um, a springboard for further improvements in the area. Um, I understand and recognise that there are risks to the project, um, and I, I will look at the process around making sure that those are included in the future. I think we, we've had this discussion before about risks because there's a very comprehensive full risk log to the program and the program board which is um kind of set you know uh, encapsulated within that board but i think there is a a clear desire which I, I fully share that in in future papers where we deal with these major programs that perhaps more of that background work is is presented uh, with the paper i know we've seen it in previous iterations of this before but we are at this end game now so i think that's a a point that um we'll certainly take on board and then the, the final thing that i would say about the risk is that there is a risk here um it's 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 laid out very clearly in the report under paragraph 24 what the next steps are and the the deadlines that we're working to and of course the risk is that is that if we cannot um uh, do it in, if we cannot finish uh, and spend all of the the let money in time and if uh, that happens as a result of a situation which is not rectifiable by negotiation then there, it could well be that bcp council has to uh, fund any gap and that is a, a a risk and that's something that we've got to accept it's something we've explored in cabinet and i think um you know as somebody that's been on this journey for a very long time um i, I think that with the mitigation 
mitigation measures that I've seen in place with the amount of detailed work that's behind the scenes, A, I, I'm assured as a cabinet member that that risk has been mitigated and I, I do feel confident, as I've said before, that it will be done in time. Um, but I'm also confident that if the worst case scenario happened, that these are improvements that are still very much needed. Um, the added effect and the, the um, uh, positivity that it will give to this area, the, the springboard, as I've said, to the future, the businesses and everything, this needs to happen. Um, so I, I appreciate that there are areas that we will need to improve and tidy up as we go forward. This has been thrown together in a very sport, short space of time, but I'm not making any um, apologies for that. Um, but equally, I do think that this is the right thing to do and it will I improve the area. And um, for that reason, I I'm still a, a big proponent of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. I uh, Councillor House, unless it's really quick, I really want to... Yeah, I'd just like to make a recommendation to put that to the vote. OK, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll read it out. Um, it says, we urge the administration to publish the results of the consultation in advance of Cabinet, broken down to reveal the views of local businesses and other stakeholders. OK, is anybody uh, going to talk to this one? Any any comments? I personally don't see any issue with that. OK, uh, it's a reasonable uh, recommend to make. If we've got the results of the consultation, why shouldn't the public see them? Um, yes, so it, unless there is a dissent on that, then we'll accept that recommendation, if anybody wishes to send, or a number of people do, then we'll go to the vote on it. But at the moment, I'm not seeing any dissent. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that as a recommendation. And uh, I think now we're going to, I'm going to draw this discussion to the close. It's been a full, full and provocative debate. Uh, Councillor Broadhead looks nearly as old as I do now, so uh, <laughs> so I think it's time to move on. Thank you. Um, where are we now? OK, agenda item seven, uh, which is the uh, transformation related cabinet report, uh, estate and accommodation project. And um, I'd like to invite Councillor Miller, the leader of the council, portfolio holder, Transformation and Finance to introduce the paper to us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Very, very pleased to be here. Um, and I'm pleased to be bringing this important report to you. Um, if I may, I'll outline the key points and we'll look forward to members' questions afterwards. As we heard earlier today during our discussion on the finance paper, um, we as a council cross party are committed to an exciting and ambitious transformation plan. It would be fundamental to us both being able to balance our short term budget and more importantly, to put us in a position where we can look to run a highly efficient organisation, which will allow us to invest further in our residents' priorities. As a part of our ambitious programme, we have the opportunity to move away from our exposure to a large and inefficient office accommodation estate, and this paper addresses that. Some, some key points, just I'll just um, uh, tease out of it. Effectively, you know, there are three um, stages to the accommodation strategy being safe working, interim spaces and, and our new normal. This, this, what this does is de decouples the service and civic elements of the station and accommodation project. Um, so we'll be establishing a member working party to discuss the future working requirements of a civic function. So today is we're just focusing on effectively the council service um, uh, element and it enables us to get on with that and, and del deliver towards um, where we're trying to trying to get to. Just in that point around the member working group, I was clear at the recent Charter Trustees um, of Paul meeting that will include, you know, the civic presence um, in the Paul Civic as part of that uh, working party to be discussed. Uh, the paper also talks about the development of um, Paul and Christchurch sites. Importantly, that's a broader definition and simply the disposal of them, which is where the paper started. Importantly, it develops our customer services, services capacity in our libraries which will really help um, our engagement objective, which is a really key part of what we're trying to do as, a, as an administration. It also approves a project budget of £6.6 .6 million, which is significantly lower than where we started um, back in well, uh, uh, February or, or earlier when we were looking at a budget of around about £30 million. So I'm really pleased that this is a much more reasonable budget. 
most importantly, Chair, it moves us towards looking and feeling like one organisation, you know, which culturally would be so important to us as we're trying to build an, you know, an organisation we can be really proud of. Um, detail and report, very happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Mellor. Do we have any, anybody wishing to raise any questions? It would seem not. Everybody obviously wants to go home. Oh, Councillor Slade. <laughs> I was going to wait for other people, <laughs> but they just didn't put the hands up, did they? Um, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I, I've Obviously, I've got a few queries I want to raise. Hold on, I need to find them now because I thought I was going to be following up. Um, OK, I've got a couple of queries. Um, I'm very happy with the, 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 the fundamentals of the paper. Um, I think it, it needs to be uh, made really clear to the public uh, that the figure of 29 million was something that we agreed on cross party before the pandemic when we had no idea that uh, working in a remote way was going to be something that the world would, would accept. Um, and that even... Um, three, four months ago, when we looked at the revision, uh, we were looking at somewhere closer to around 10, 12 million pounds um, for the project. So it's not been 29 million pounds for a long, long time. And, you know, I wouldn't want the public to think that we've gone from 29 million pounds to 6 million pounds, um, you know, overnight. We've been on a, quite a long journey around that. Um, Obviously, because of that change in numbers, that the way it can be financed also changes. And I'm sure Councillor Cox will talk about finances because that's more his bag than mine. I just wanted to, to, to clarify a couple of things. The decoupling of the office space from the civic space, something which we'd agreed to do uh, back in the summer and we actually looked at setting up a, a members working group then and was obviously put on hold with the change of administration. I am slightly concerned that although it's good to decouple them, there's absolutely no hint uh, at, at what an estimated budget around that might be. I mean, are we talking 1 million, 5 million or another 10 million? Um, you know, we, we need to understand the, the scope of, of that to some extent. Otherwise, there's no means of establishing how that might be funded. Um, and there's also nothing around the timeline for that because we can't move to a hybrid council model and we can't make a commitment to stream our live meetings and to come into the 21st century with our, you know, voting um, without that civic work being done. And if I remember rightly from the work that I had been doing with the corporate director, the, the public entrance of the of the council, that what happens to the parlour and any potential cafe space that, that would actually bring the council in more into the, into the um, community is part of the civic space footprint um, and is fundamental to making the civic centre properly accessible. So if that is being delayed, because of the decoupling, what commitment is there to make the whole of the um, campus fully disabled friendly? Um, that, that's quite a big concern of mine. Uh, the other issues are around the future of the annex. In one paragraph, it's, it's ignored as saying we're going to be working from the main building and the um, extension, no reference to the annex, but later on, it's referenced as remaining although it's in the BDC business plan to be redeveloped. So is that happening or isn't that happening? Um, and finally, the, the other issue I've got is around hubs. We talked about people having three choices of how they worked, working in the civic centre, working at home or working in a community hub, such as our libraries. There's no mention of any of our staff being accommodated through community hubs, only the customer services being uh, facilitated through the three main libraries. So it'd be really good to get a, an answer on that. So um, that, that's my start of 10. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Miller. 
Yeah, th thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, um, uh, Councillor Slade. There, uh, you know, as, as you'll be aware, you know, th this was your report, and until um, and, until I took it over, We've largely the only thing we've changed in it is removing the words disposal, which was you know uh, written into it many times, and um, so effectively, it's, it's, it's still seeing the same report that you. That was changed in June to the word repurpose. It, well, it, well, it wasn't in the report I saw, so um, I, you know, I, I've removed a word. I've personally removed a word disposal from that many times. Um, so f thank you very much for, for your report, which I largely agree with. Um, a few things, I won't, won't take them in any particular order. You, you talked about the, uh, the £29 million. Pounds. Well, what is a fact, um, Councillor Slade, is at the date of our Conservative um, transformation paper, the, the, the figure that was still being used from, from the administration was £29 million. Pounds. So I'm delighted we've got to where we've got to um, in terms of £6 million, pounds, not, not £29 million. Pounds. Um, we, I have a view that it was our, our pressure that was enabling you to um, get get down to that figure. So at least a good bit of uh, good bit of work from from scrutiny there. Um, in terms of a civic piece, I think it really depends what's how much it's going to cost. Well, a really good place to start is let's ask our members what they think they should they should have, and then you know it's, it sits next to what budget it should be. And if there is an idea how we can fund it, because you can prudentially borrow for um, two point four percent over forty years to to do it, which is exactly what the report says um, uh, as 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 well. Um, yeah, I, I can assure you that I've already had significant discussions around a hybrid option, um, which you know you'll be aware of what needs to happen for for for, for that to go ahead. And I'm absolutely committed for as quick as, as quickly as we can, we will be developing a, a hybrid option in our in our council chamber. Um, very much look forward to 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 that working party. Trying to see if I've got any other questions. That um, yeah, in, in terms of the annex, um, I think well, the, the the plan there is that uh, we need. In t uh, what's happened with new ways of working is that effectively less and less people will need to be in a in a um, in an office. So we're expecting to be able to fit everybody into the um, the, the the town hall, the de developed town hall. While we're proving that, we are retaining the the, um, the the space in the annex. Um, so it's still the anticipation that um, we will be able to exit that, but we need to prove we can we can fit everybody into into the town hall. And lastly, I believe you talked about will um, we have uh, dropping facilities for um, for for officers in the libraries, and that's still very much the, the ambition. So I believe that was most of the questions. That was, uh, you, you that, was slide. that was the uh, disabled uh, friendly access. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a really important thing. You know, we we brought forward an Equalities Lead member. Um, we're absolutely committed to um, uh, the um, disability access uh, points. It's a real issue at the moment. It's a real issue for the coroners. You know, where, where that is and how they have to access access the building. So uh, yeah, he, hear you loud and clear. It's an agenda we're we're absolutely championing, and you know, we'll have to be a part of this this solution. Thank you, Councillor Meller. Um, Councillor Mike Cox, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I appreciate you're making a very big uh, disposing of disposal, um, but uh, I'm afraid that you're just playing smoke and mirrors with that. Uh, you know damn well you're going to dispose of uh, these these assets. So dis disposing of disposal is just playing smoke and mirrors, in my opinion. However, unfortunately, you do have a, a habit of exaggerating uh, at various items, uh, and uh, and you do seem to be uh, exaggerating enormously any potential changes that have been made to this particular item. One particular item I'm uh, concerned with is that uh, you're, you've changed the financing of this to borrowing. Uh, so I'd like you to just confirm that that is the case. Uh, I did, um, I, I think we had some unanimity uh, a, a while ago when we said that we should only be borrowing to invest. I don't really consider a lot of this to be investing. This is this is changing. This is restructuring, uh, and uh, I, you, sh you should be borrowing to invest by actually buying buying assets, which uh, which will be long um, for the long term and for our future uh, for future residents. And um, this is this is not necessarily borrowing in that in that uh, for investing. This is just borrowing to change things. Thank you. Yes, Delighted well, to respond, uh, uh, Chair, if I may. Yes, of course. I'll, I'll do the, the the last point first. Slightly disappointed, man of your um, uh, background, to have such a limited version of in investments. I think it's quite clear in the report that it, this says this will develop a seven hundred thousand pound ongoing net benefit. Um, that's after the the, the the cost of borrowing there. 
Um, so effectively, this this works will it will um, net us a benefit of 700k, uh, and that's largely to do with the, the vast maintenance um, budget. You also said um, uh, I've, I've over exaggerated the changes in the report. Well, I believe in my response to Councillor Slade, I said very clearly, Mike, that um, the only change I made was the word disposal. You know, largely in it. So, so I don't think I'm over exaggerating anything. And also, I don't think you're right, actually, in terms of we're going to we, I know damn well we're going to dispose of it because, you know, you could just we could dispose of it. We could do a joint venture with it. We could um, develop it ourselves. What we're going to do, which is what you weren't going to do, is to calmly look at it and get best value for our assets and best value for our taxpayers while delivering the council of the future. Thank you very much, Mike. Councillor Cox, you OK? OK. Yes, absolutely fine. Um, but uh, I think my response would be in your dreams. Thank you. All right. Thank you. There's no other hands up. Uh, and with that, I think I'll Excuse me. With... There, I, have I believe my... Councillor Howell is, uh, Howell is, is waiting. Um, Chair. Is he? Oh, that was last minute. <laughs> Go on then. Make it quick, please. Yeah, I, I guess you know, take, like to take up um, Councillor Mayor on this last point, saying that we weren't, you know, that. <laughs> going to do you know take take a good look at a uh, specific center and how to move it forward and that is certainly not my view at all um as a you know former regeneration portfolio holder I, you know i i was very interested uh in 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 how we might move that forward and i didn't personally rule anything out this wasn't brought to cabinet um for a, a decision and um uh, you know and we are very early stages of considering what to do with that property so you know i i personally um welcome uh, a, a considered view uh development of a strategy and i hope that members widely will be involved in that I'm, i am concerned that uh, a quick sale uh, of the Pool Civic Centre in particular may not release the best value, um, given that you know we we own these sites uh, and we potentially have uh, are in the best position to uh, to make planning gain out of them. Um, but but you know we 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 need we need to we we do need to look at these carefully, and that uh, and that was certainly my always my intention um and um I, I i take great exception to the line in the report which if i read it if i can find the right document um which is difficult because i'm it's supposed to be in modern gov um so i respond in, to your first points first mark while you yeah. um yeah find that brilliant if i may chair yes Thank you. Um, I just I agree with you. You know, just uh, fun, fundamentally agree with you. You know, you said a quick sale won't be in the best interests of, of of us, and and I I believe that firmly. I've been on record saying I I you know whether it's this asset or other assets, there is pressure um, in a two, in a two year capital receipts to revenue window that we sell. You know, make capital receipts, and I don't think that's the best way for us to um, make value up, up, out of our assets. I'm on record in the in our transport uh, uh, transformation paper again talking about planning game exactly that mark so, so i completely agree with you and um you know that, that that's absolutely fine what, what, what i can say is that this administration my administration will look to see how we can get long-term value for our for our assets whether that means disposing them or developing them whether that that means you know acquiring lo lots of others of them so look we're on we're on the same page here you know uh, from from your comments yeah, thank you. Um, the, the point I was going to make was in, in, in point four of the paper, it says specifically the intention is no longer to dispose of Pool Civic Centre in its entirety. Uh, and, uh, and it was always my intention and that every opportunity I had to say it, I did, that we would re we should retain uh, the, the, the civic rooms, uh, the, 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 the gas stop room and the um uh in the chamber uh and, and therefore I, I just think that that is an inaccurate statement there and should not have been included by officers in this paper uh you know the, a decision was never taken to cabinet with regard to this a, a, a figure might have been put in um in general accounts as to how much we might uh gain from from selling parts of the the, the civic center but the, the the disposable was uh, never approved by cabinet so I, I i do 
you know, I, I do feel very disappointed that that statement has uh, found its way into this paper. Thank you. If you could quickly then, uh, Councillor Meller, respond to that. Yeah, it's, it's just, we've discussed this before, Ben, but potentially, you know, this is a paper that was under, you know, your previous leader. Um, th these these discussions around this site have been regularly, you know, if it's sloppy wording because the word has, has been disposal without any explanation, say for disposal, but not of those bits. Look, we are where we are, Mark. You know, yeah, it's I, not. It's I, not. I've, I've it's inherited not a paper. Word. I it's don't think it's too long. Yeah. To talking it's, over each other. Is it? Is it? Is it? Uh, is gentlemen, it gentlemen, 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 through the chair, please. Let's not have a free I was, fall. I was in the process of finishing. Yeah. The, the um, point yeah, I was yeah, trying oh, to make. Um, Council, Councillor Mellor, please carry on. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, you know, we, we are where we are. My view is I've seen on a number of occasions, both in this paper and previously, the word disposal has been used without any clarification. If that wasn't intended, that's absolutely fine, Mark. But, um, you know, that's yeah, why that's I'm not, saying... That wasn't, my, that wasn't my point. I wasn't making a point about the word disposal. I was saying that the, 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 it says specifically, and this is really perhaps an officer point rather than a point for... For you, Councillor Mallet, it says specifically the attention. The intention is no longer to dispose of Pool Civic Centre in its entirety. And I, what I'm saying, it was never the intention of Cabinet to dispose of it in its entirety because uh, it never got to Cabinet and uh, it never got to the point where we would uh, discussing that other than in very general terms. Uh, and as I say, you know. It, we, we would, you know, there would have been very strong opposition uh, if it was proposed uh, that that the that the pool civic was disposed of in its entirety. So I I I I don't understand how how the how officers have managed to put that conclusion in there, suggesting that we were going to dispose of it in its entirety. I, and I think that's that's unfair. Okay, Councillor Howell. Yeah, I, I see that uh, Julian Oscar thought is actually put his hand up but uh councillor slade you were before then do you want to speak or would you like some just just uh, very briefly i just want to make it clear that I, it's it's this is really twisting words because i think it's uh, for the for the benefit of the public the the decision that the, the the amount that we would get if in principle we were to sell paul civic center or christchurch civic center was set up in a in a, a workshop over a year ago to, to set up the operating model. The £29 million was set in, 20, in, in February as a in principle figure uh, without detail. It was never costed um, and was agreed to by everyone. And the fact that you suggest that whether your words, Councillor Miller, whether you disposed of it or did a joint venture or did something else, you'd get best value. Of course, you'd get best value. It is a requirement under the law, under the Local Government Act, that this council gets best value for any asset at any time. So to suggest that we would not have got best value, whichever route the council decided to take when it was ready to take that decision, is disingenuous again, because it suggests that we wouldn't be getting best value, which is not right, because Mr Richins would not allow that to happen. Um, and to, to back up what Marcus said, at no point was any suggestion that the entirety would be disposed of. And you know that very, very well. And I hope that Mr Oscar thought will clarify that position because that part of the building is actually listed. Uh, and there was always a conversation about how do we square this circle with making sure that the Charter Trustees had somewhere to work from, that the people of Paul still have their civic heritage, um, and that we also made the very best use of that site, potentially by putting it into the HRA, potentially by doing, you know, working with a partner, potentially by selling it. But no decision, as you know, had been taken at that point in time that that is something that you know to be true thank you councillor slade i'd like to bring in um mr oscar thorpe now please thank you thank you chair i fear i'm going to make myself unpopular with both sides of this particular debate but i do think it's important that i respond to the point that councillor hal raised and i think it's it is um, necessary for us to remember that this has been evolving for quite some time now, almost 12 months. 
uh, when you think that the initial report from KPMG with regards to the organizational design and the proposed transformation model was adopted by cabinet in November and then there was a further paper in February which began the discussion around the future of our estate and specifically the role uh, of the three uh, civic centres at that stage. It was clear in that paper in February that the hypothetical maximum funding issue of 29 million for the redevelopment of the Bournemouth Town Hall campus was predicated on the release of Pool Civic Centre and Christchurch Civic Centres. In the June paper, which went through Cabinet and to full Council, uh, Councillor Slade is quite right that the language in paragraph 54A, um, I think from memory, was modified to say the release and or repurposing of some aspects of those sites. Uh, and we've now got to this paper where we are making the statement that it is no longer the intention. The simple fact is it has evolved over a period of 12 months and through two different administrations and multiple engagements with different uh, representatives and councillors. Uh, and if that modification or, or the, the sequence of that modifi modification in our language is causing concerns, I apologise. But if, if, if it is, it was an intention to most accurately reflect the views of the officers uh, of the circumstances that we found ourselves in nearly 12 months on from the, the initial paper where we started the journey. Thank you, Mr. Oscar Thorpe. Uh, with that, I, I, I really would like, I see that we've got... Um, I, I see you want to respond, um, Councillor Mellor, but in view of that statement, are you, would you be happy for me to move on to Councillor Ms. Rugby? Uh, please do. I can perhaps respond in a summing up, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rigby. Thanks, Chair. Um, I want to go down a little bit of a different route with this paper. To be honest, I think that's um, been covered quite well um, by Councillor Slade and Councillor Cox. Um, I want to talk about the environmental side of things. I mean, I feel like it often falls to me to do this, but no one else seems to be picking up on it at the moment. And um, throughout this paper, there is absolutely no mention of the environmental impact. If going through it, the only real mention is that having um, one centre will reduce carbon emissions by reducing travelling between sites. There's absolutely nothing talking about the opportunity which we've got to create something new with this building and take this opportunity to really refurbish it and bring it in line with not just best working practice but exceeding it and um, bringing up the environmental standards of the building in its entirety. Um, coupled with that as well there's no mention of IT or technology upgrades which again would not only help the environmental impact side of things but also improve the ability for people who are working from home. In the um, equalities statement and all of that, I noticed that um, a survey had been carried out with um, a lot of our staff, although a third of them chose not to answer a number of the questions. But I think a third of people said they didn't have the right equipment or weren't able to work properly from home. Um, they don't have the ability, they don't either have the capability or even the desire with some people to work at home and obviously we've got to balance um, mental and physical health and accessibility and things like that to all working practices and all this can tie in with what we've got here in an ability to create a truly futuristic council building which you know keeps hold of our heritage but moves into the future as well allowing people to work from home but this has to be done properly and really the paper doesn't mention in any way how this can be achieved or even details it as something which is being looked at could you please say what your thoughts are on that please may um, i come in before julian sure um uh, yeah i don't think um <clears throat> julian has put his hand up oh, yes, he has <laughs> okay oh, yeah, of Captain course Mayor. Councillor Mayor. Uh, although although what i think i'd like to do if possible is 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 for julian to respond and then for you to summarize uh, which will close the. Is that okay? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, for sure, Chair, it's, it's your, absolutely your committee. I, I believe a portfolio holder should respond and the officer should should come in if a portfolio holder would, would, or it hasn't said enough. But um, your, your okay, committee, no, Chair, that's, and fine. that's fine. No, you go ahead, Councillor Mellor. Uh, th thank you. Well, uh, uh, thank you, um, Councillor Rigby, Chris. Um, you know, I've, I've spoke about in our transformation paper, I keep going back to the things we've talked about for the last you know, number of months, but I spoke about none of the buildings we've got being in the right place, really. You know, they're not... Um, they're not near transport hubs, so none of the three sites were, were, were perfect. Um, <clears throat> you know, there is a potential option to move, you know, move to a different building, a new building, or, you know, but that's not being um, taken forward here. But what has been done, which is actually going to be quite, you know, quite positive, is by moving to the libraries, particularly, I know Paul Library well, you're actually, you know, in a major transport hub, so you're minutes away from a train station, and you're right next to a, uh, a, a bus station. So, you know, in terms of some economic, uh, not economic, um, environmental impact there, I believe that's actually a step forward, which is which I'm I'm pleased about. I talked earlier on today um, about the uh, moving, trying to move forward with a community mutual bond. Many different ways of funding things, but if it, a bond that effectively was all about um, an, an environmental piece, it raised one two million pounds to invest in environmental projects. So it'd be a very good, you know, funding source if we found um, things we could do to our building to to, to move it forward. So. Yeah, all is very, very keen to, you know, um, look at what we could do. And uh, thank you for thank you for bringing it up. And the, the last point is about the IT um, thing. You're, you're, again, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, but that comes in a different paper. You know, we're about to, um, you know, uh, launch a, uh, a, a a massive partnership where we you know, we'll get us all the skills and, you know, and, um, technology, back, you know, back office stuff that we need alongside the right kit and a, and a commonality of kit. You know, I've been really pleased with the um, some of the IT work that's already been done in, in for instance, the Annex, where you can now got you know commonality. So in, when you when you go, never council laptops is all is all set up properly. So um, hopefully, um, chair, chair, while I'm at it, just in, in, to save to save something up later, I'll, I'll just also respond to Councillor Slade's point. I, I don't believe you're right actually about uh, about best value. Um, there's a requirement if you're selling something to make sure you've got best value, which is done through. Um, you know, uh, reports of uh, professionals reports. There's no requirement to explore all the options. There's no requirement to say, why don't we keep it and put planning permission or why don't we do that particular part of planning permission? On day one, I said I wanted all of our um, options explored and I was not going to keep um, the, your, your approach to disposal of assets. Um, and, and Mark, responding to your point about the paper and the wording in it, well, actually, I fundamentally believe that these are portfolio holder papers, they're not, they're not officers' papers, you know, so so we, we build them up together, but it's my responsibility is what, what's in that paper. And, you know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with it. So um, it might not be in the way your administration, you know, wrote those papers, but it certainly will be ours going forward. Uh, Chair, I believe that's all I needed to sum up. I don't know if uh, uh, Mr Os Oscarport would like to still come in. Mr Oscarthorpe. Um, Chair, given Councillor Mellor's comments, I don't think it's a appropriate for me to go in, into the detail. Um, yes. However, I am happy to provide a written response to Councillor Rigby's um, comments with regards to, to the paper and the proposition to, to him and to the committee as a whole going forward, if you would prefer that, given the lateness in the evening. Yes, thank you. Uh, appropriate, uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Rigby. Um, yeah, I'd really appreciate knowing that. That'd be brilliant. Yes. Thank you, Julie. OK, if we could just just record that as an action, please, in the minutes. Thank you. Well, I, I believe we've come to the end of that debate, a rather interesting debate, and uh, I think we've come to the end of the meeting, so I'm going to close it now. Thank you.